Old World Florida. Old World Florida. Old World Florida. Dude, I'm telling you, dude. Dr. Narco Longo came on and dropped the hammer of the guy. America's mother, daughter of Atlantis. God sent the weatherland. The devil sent the Spanish. Florida is Eden, the phantom of Newton. Carly is deception. So Florida is the truth. Welcome to Florida, baby. What's up, guys? How we're doing this glorious Sunday? Uh, here we are, the Church of New Atlantis, Sunday church service, Bible study. And but we're not going to be yapping too much. We're going to be reading from the best book that there's ever been, the Bible, Old and New Testament. We might even go into the, you know, the Apocrypha a little bit. We got that, too, over here. But, um, you know, nothing's hidden from us. Nothing's restricted from Christians. Everything's available. This is as good as it gets. This is, you know, Bhagavad Gita, Quran, you know, the list goes on and on. This takes the cake, I have to say. Now, there's no arrogance in that statement. I might be arrogant and, you know, whatever, but it's objective. So. Basically, we're going to be talking about Genesis. We're going to be getting into some interesting connections with the native people of Florida and their creation myth. And we're really just going to drill the point home that indigenous wisdom is contained within the Bible. And some people would say, okay, well, yeah, because there's indigenous people in Eurasia and that trickled into the greater empires, the Greek or Hebrew, and then that became this. No, 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 no. It's, you're gonna, we're going to find mirrored cosmology, mythology in the Americas. So officially, officially, there should be no link between the two. But I think you guys are going to really marvel at the creation story of the Temucua people and how similar it is to your good old King James Version Bible. And yeah, we've got our heavy hitter co host here, Alan Erickson, Al Diggity Dog, author of The Shorter, which becomes ever, ever more relevant, more relevant each day as more crime and scandals are exposed and things like the Diddy case and CIA revelations. But Al Dog, what's up, man? Dude, excited to be here, man, because going over the book really fits into my definition of being an educated person, right? I think this this book is something that everybody needs to be familiar with, right? And it's something that when we converse and we talk about it, it's probably the best way to learn about it. And um, I hope the, the audience greatly benefits from Dr. Narco Longo here reading from Genesis, because I think it's going to blow some minds. I got some ideas. I've made so many connections the last couple of days uh, with just my own life, my own spiritual evolution 
connecting with you know the bible ancient atlantis astrology um pop cultural references that parallel it's all just there and uh i'm excited to be here sweet i think let us know how we're sounding guys alan i think they might want you to go up a bit okay up okay that's my that's my fault because i told him to go down because i pushed myself all the way up because usually i'm quiet yeah but we'll see so i went from a 50 to a 74 how do people <laughs> feel <laughs> how do people feel about 74 the righteous number yeah I didn't. I, I just kind of did seventy four. Let's see how I'm gonna log into good old YouTube here. Y'all sound well, crazy as f. <laughs> better. Okay. Seventy seven better. Uh, so should I go to seventy seven? Seventy four is good, right? Seventy seven is better. Okay, let's go to seventy seven <laughs> then. No complaints. So I'm gonna I'm gonna assume it's really good. Yeah. But we'll go to yeah. 7. The Thortillage Genesis is my favorite book in the Bible. It's yeah. just the coolest. It's on par. It's so, it's like science fiction, and I don't use that in a bad way at all. It's like, it's like real science fiction. It's like real space opera. It's like real, you know, as, it's as new agey as it gets. And I say that in the least, you know, least derogatory way possible. That's anything you'd Eternally. seek to get, anything you'd seek to get from like distant, deep fantasy is right here. Nice. It's that, it's that intriguing. It's that mythological and it's that timeless. You know, the symbols are timeless. It's, it's distilled down into very simple terms, believe it or not. What were, what were you going to say? Al? I was going to say, it's like not new age. It's like eternal age. It's mm -hmm. something that's true throughout the cycles, the ups and downs of civilizations, of nations, this, that, and the third. It's it's something that is um, – when it's cyclically true, I mean, it. no matter what, the sun is coming up the next day. No matter what, some of the parables in here are true, and it's inescapable, and it's eternal. So it's like eternal age, which is like superior to new age. Yep. We're just going to dive right in, guys. We're not going to talk the app too much, but we're going to, you know, review. I'll give you guys my take. Alan will give you his take. And I'm sure we've all heard people like Bill Donahue, Santos Panacci. You know, anytime you, you're approaching Christianity, we, we've got to declare we're aware of the astro theology. We're aware of the universal solar savior archetypes you know but let's just put put that all to the side and also something we've covered in other videos christianity is not just a outcropping of judaism we've debunked that so many others have debunked that and we we're lucky enough to you know read their stuff out loud not true christianity is arctic or it's you know etched in the heavens as much as the old testament is so yes, there's astro theology, and we're not ignorant of that. So moving forward, don't be afraid of any literal interpretations because we're not limited to them. Okay, that's the disclaimer there. So starting off, Old Testament straight out of the King James Version Bible, the Holy Bible, chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters and god said let there be light and there was light and god saw the light that it was good and god divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So, we've kind of addressed this a little bit before, but God is detailing himself. 
He's declaring his qualities, his foremost qualities. Light. God is in charge of light. So behind this light spectrum, behind every cell and molecule, you know, this elusive plasma and the whole electromagnetic spectrum, rainbows, everything in between spawns out of light. And God is responsible for the light spectrum. And right there, at the very least, God is light. Okay? We don't need a man with a beard. And yes, God creates us out of his image. We're going to get into that later. But at the very least, can we all agree that God is light? The Hindus, the Buddhists, everyone. Okay, so just building, we're building a foundation here. Super important. Very simple. Strong, sturdy, megalithic building blocks. God is light and is the authority of light. So, and God said also day and night. God created the day, which means light. And the night means darkness. Okay. Well, that does not mean 24 hours until a little bit later on here, we're going to see the creation of the heavens and the bodies in the heavens. So day and night right now does not have a set time. There's no way of measuring time. Okay. So you're going to hear first night, first, second, third. We don't know if these mean 24 hours. For the sake of storytelling, they're likened to days in sequence. Everyone's got to be able to see, see, see through this and work with the storytelling, work with the literary you know, devices, the allegory. Work with it. It's a living, breathing you know, conversation. And people always limit themselves into the most literal. Or once they've reached the astrotheological, theological, the kind of discard literal, literal interpretation. So chapter one, verse one through six is what we just read. Alan. Man. Substantial. Um, yeah. These are like the the founding elements of where we exist. And this is where we see God and it's being told to us explicitly. Um, you bring up people, you know, going beyond the literal into all these other layers. I think that's part of being literate is to, you know, it's not like you're reading an explicit instruction manual. There's seven layers of truth to each verse. And, you know, what we've gone over is some people like they spot one of the layers and they sort of dismiss the other six layers because they spotted one and they act like a special boy because they figured out one code of this seven layered structure for every verse. Yeah. And uh, that's not what we're what we're doing here. But, you know, my most core take is keep going because i'm I, i'm preach man because this is important i want to hear this this is uh this is the best way to get because like if i were to read this even with a study bible it's not quite the same as what god is preaching with in the beginning was the word the spoken word human beings interacting uh speaking this stuff out loud not just limited to the written word uh you know, so the the social aspect of the Bible being a living, breathing book is again, it is it is so substantial. So uh, I'm all ears right now. Sweet, good, great points. And also, uh, you brought up you know the the constraints of storytelling. Like uh, when you tell a story, you are telling a linear story. Every time you open your mouth, it's a linear sequence, right? The words that come out are in a linear sequence. There's no escaping that unless you tape something and play it backwards. So some concepts are timeless. Just flat out, you know, can't be boiled down into a, a sentence. So we do the best we can as people, you know, the authors of this book, the sages, the scribes, 
you have to do the best you can to frame things linearly because you have to tell it to other people. You can't just, you know, knock someone out and give them the fractal schematics of the universe and say, yeah, there's your 5D, you know, quantum experience. No, it's, you know, that can be achieved with an adequate interpretation of the Bible. Okay. So that's, you know, constraints of storytelling. It's linear. So don't, don't be, uh, don't hold this to a 1 million percent linear. Every second passing is a second as it would be in your life, you know, in, in our waking realm. It's not like that. And we just explained the days are going to be different from the days of today in length until the astrological bodies are created. But here, let's get to it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 7. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And here, you know, shame on me. I forgot to mention the waters earlier. God moved upon the face of the waters earlier in yeah. verse 2. Now, I liken this to cymatics. When you see sound acting on liquid and compelling it into geometric forms, compelling it into motion, into dance, into divine, you know, sequence. There, how does the salt on the table know that when it shifts from a thousand hertz to twelve thousand hertz? For anyone who's seen cymatics, I hope you can, you know envision this how does the salt on the table know what shape it's going to take next how could it but yet it's ingrained in the backstage of nature behind the curtain all of this has been ingrained in a geometric framework to where when fuck was i just saying i'm saying i'm ripped y'all <laughs> Cyma cymatics <laughs> cymatics uh, is hertz. yeah yeah so i'll do the, my best to describe it for those who have haven't seen cymatics salt on a table when exposed to super loud you know sound waves like high air pressure um will take geometric form right and this is a similar thing that happens when alligators bellow under the water they create almost like a motorboat, like chop above them, that that phases in and out, like the water will go flat to geometrically disturbed, like you'll see shapes, very strange. So alligators can bellow under the water and make it vibrate into these shapes. Wow. And there's music videos on YouTube. Go look up Cymatics, C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-F. Cymatics, if you'd like to see what moving upon the face of the waters looks like, if you'd like to see how matter could be compelled into movement and into life, dare I say, and I'm not saying matter, you know, we've ever lived in a lifeless earth, but if you'd want to know what this is, you know, being summed up, what this sums up is cymatics. Mm -hmm. How water will take shape, respond to sound, music. So yeah. there's also sonoluminescence. Look up Star in a Jar. Look it up on YouTube. We can't cover everything in depth right now, but Star in a Jar, Cymatics, Sonoluminescence. This is what it means. Sound acting light, prompting, you know, the waters to move and light to and earth to spring out of the waters. So yeah. Cymatics, yeah. man. It's I just listened to a two hour podcast basically on uh cymatics. And sometimes, you know, light, water, sound can be combined to create healing frequencies and mm -hmm. uh these types of things. And it's interesting because I've observed every truther, whoever is on a truth path eventually gets to cymatics and it's just funny to me that it's at the very beginning of the bible 
the very, mm -hmm. very beginning saying, yep. hey, I'm God. This is how I reveal myself. When you do yes. these things, when you get the right vibration, you can see it so clearly in water um, and as well as, you know, other forms of light and sound. When you combine it, who knows? I was going to say sky's the limit, but the firmament is clearly the limit. It's just described in uh, Genesis. And that's one thing that seems to be quite literal. Yes, here we go. Yeah, just real quick, our first visual of the night. Cymatics. This is the salt on a plate experiment, but it takes many other forms. You know, a lot of people show this and talk about this. I don't put plaster this all over my YouTube channel because it's very played out, but it's, you know, this is God. This is how God reveals himself as our dog, you know, gracefully summed up. It's the geometric fabric of the universe that only music reveals and architecture all these other sciences are just extensions of you know the fundamental hum coming of the universe that's animating all of us we're all like this little we're all these little grains of salt on the big uh metallic plate there being hummed into action and that's how god works also i'm going to be you know, as we get to the firmament and the bodies that God makes up in the sky, I liken this creation story to like a 3D printer. And, you know, it's important that we draw from the modern, the modern repertoire of, of terms, you know, of imagery, different new, new technologies can be woven into this new imagery. It needs to be updated, mm -hmm. right? Not everyone knows what, what an ox and a plow and, fixing a wagon wheel is like, you know, it's gotta be, you know, so I'm not afraid to, to draw from fuck. what I just say? You were talking about a 3d printer being the best yeah, yeah, modern thank analogy. You. 3d printer, yeah. 3d printer being how, you know, you, you have right in front of your face, a way that matter can almost spring up. It seems out of nowhere mm -hmm. and combine that with, in interest in cymatics or you know a little insight into cymatics and you've got a good recipe for for spontaneous creation mm -hmm. and i that's not the crux of, of my faith in the bible is you know i don't think that there was a single spontaneous creation um you know at the snap of the finger like a big bang big bang because you know that that is the big bang that essentially of course, if they are pushing us in a sudden explosion direction, I would have to tend towards the other side, which would be the world's always been here. Matter's always been here. And these linear stories are encapsulating something else. It's not trying to say this happened before this, but it's more establishing the framework of reality. You know, the light becomes comes before the sound comes before the water comes before the matter and who knows <laughs> you know we're, we're we don't have all the answers here guys there's many greats you can go look up we're speculating a little bit i am but whatever move forward spencer is here what up spence what's, what's up going, spence man? oh hey guys how you doing i'm gonna turn my thing sideways was that like uh, that cymatics? Was that spoke things into existence type talk? Yeah, mm -hmm. you heard cymatics and you're like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, just like I like vibrations. I like good vibrations. So, what, what, where did, um, what did I miss so far? Just you know, the uh, short, short term. Where are we at? I'd like to chime in. Talking about Genesis chapters one through six. Okay, light. The, uh, you know, what does it mean when God says he moved on the, it's said that God moved upon the face of the waters. Uh, what does that mean? To me, that brings cymatics to mind. And then the light coming before, after this light being good, good being God, God is declaring his attributes, his okay. most bare and essential, you know, foundational understanding he's laying out very simple all right so like let there let there be light 
origins. Yeah, basically. Like, basically, what we've been going over is just like the building blocks of our realm. And God is saying, hey, you know, I'm in, I'm light, man. When you see light, that's me. When okay. you see cymatics, that's me. When you see water, that's me. Um, and now we've been talking about how this is something that is, you know, it's true now, but it's something that's cyclically true and eternally true versus sort of a new age perspective where things are new and becoming, um, uh, you know, the, the new age isn't as new, like the, is what I'm trying to say. You mean the new age as in the new age that's the like hip culture that's getting into this and talking about this. It's not news. That's what you're saying, right? Exactly. Of course. Yes. Of course. And, you know, when I hear when I think of light and water, I mean, isn't that you, you need both, right? Isn't that the electric and the magnetic the projector and the receiver, for example? Mm -hmm. You know, on my way home, when I was coming back to get home here, I was like, oh, it's a Sunday church, uh, Church of Atlanta. So I stopped in this Catholic um, cemetery. Okay. And I asked Longo when he was in town, I was like, what is the significance, you know, in Catholicism where they show more of uh, of Mary as well, but she's generally receiving her hands are here, his are here and his. And I just got a video for you guys of Jesus has got his hands out here. Right. And he's projecting up. But then her hands are down right behind him in a statue. I got this cool little video. And then exactly on in the other altar in the woods. Jesus out, Mary is here, in, and she's and she's like recessed into the wall. What do you guys get out of that? And do you guys think Mary is missing from Western Christianity at all? I've been wondering that. So Fem generally, or just the feminine. Yeah, generally when I think about Jesus projecting outward like the sun, it's positive, and mm -hmm. she's sort of representing you know a feminine archetype. She's receiving. She's negative in polarity. So that's kind of what my interpretation of what you just laid down. Yeah, I mean, that's just, I just, I just, like I said, I, I go from physics into metaphysics. I wasn't born or raised in the opposite. So it's, it's a lot easier for me to find spiritual awakening and metaphysics through first understanding creation, I guess, creation to the creator, as opposed to this, here's your creator, understand this text and script, you know, and, you know, this is all of creation. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm in like reverse mode, I guess. I, instead of creator or creation, I just say God. Yeah, you know I do too. I mean? Yeah, God. What yeah. do you think, Longo? What, what, is there anything yeah. feminine that, that that you think is maybe missing at all or no? No, if you read the Bible and you're not superstitious or preoccupied with what one church is saying outside of the Bible, there's really no adulterations. There's no you know, missing elements, we're actually going to see, you know, if you use some of the Hebrew or ancient Greek terms, you know, let us make them in our image, for example, that one even comes through in many of the English translations of the Bible. God is identified as plural and feminine. Ah. Now, hang, now, hang on. Okay. You know, so some people don't really you know, bring the right uh, key to the map when they're reading some of this stuff. And might sometimes you might have to look up an old Hebrew definition to fill it in here. But if God is good and women are good, why would women not identify with God? If God is good and the creator of all, is, is woman not included in there? In fact, you know, yeah. in, many, in many languages, when you say them all, it's inherently masculine. Some languages, when you say them all, it's inherently feminine. So I don't take either of those personally. It's just a preference, might be regional. You include both the sexes. Typically, it's both the sexes included into the masculine because there's man. Man includes man and woman. Woman is an adaptation of men. Okay. Right? According yeah, to the Bible. So I think if it's. It's almost like race ideology. If you bring gender ideology into the Bible and are looking to be catered to with a female God, you know, foremostly female, because I see the masculine singular God as including both halves entirely. You know, new to, uh, the Mary's the New Testament. So we'll get to the New Testament maybe a little later. 
and we can talk about uh, Mary. But so as far as yeah. So are you are you insinuating God as a genderless deity or both? God or is good, and He's probably yeah. more masculine. It's masculine. Or okay. masculine. Yeah. Up Darn. there in the sky, yeah. in the heavens, author of the heavens, author of the heavens. And what Definitely was the, author, and what was the word you used for the 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 woman was a um a what of man? It was a um, you just said it. Well, that's not biblical. That's just me, you know, conversating. But adaptation and adaptation. Extens extension, right. outcropping, okay. womb, man, man with a womb, or the wounded man. Some cultures say man, a woman is wounded. That's why she's lesser than man. She's literally lesser in numerical value to man because she's missing a member. She's missing her male appendage and instead wounded. There's an inward bleeding gash. Not to, not to be graphic, but this is where you get some of the wounded imagery of... of. Also, you know, it, it brings up a little bit of Lloyd Pye conversation of interspecies... Oh, geez. You know, interspecies, uh, that's a whole other interpretation there. Interspecies uh, mingling with man or a lesser hominid species or a different type of man. But the rib being taken out upon the creation of Eve, Eve coming from the rib, rib of Adam, could indicate a switch from some primate species, larger great apes, you know, primates that have one fewer, sorry, one extra rib than us, one extra connected rib in their rib cage. And the shift from that to full modern man, Cro Magnon, Homo sapien, whatever you want to call it, is the ironing out of, I believe, only six attached ribs, only the ribs, uh, one fewer rib. From a possible hominid ancestor and i'm not saying that's a linear story or that's what's written in the bible that's another interpretation yeah god is masculine and there's unapologetic god is masculine he's the author of the heavens light fire the sky mother earth is mother earth it's it's okay it's universal should we get back to the book? Yeah. Let's get into it. Sorry, guys. That was a that was a long intro for me just asking questions. All right. I'm here to listen now. Verse 7. Went, yep. He just went by the, the firmament part. I think it was the last one we, we yeah. uh, read. And God called the firmament heaven. So what is heaven, guys? Heaven. People's like, oh, people are always like, oh, I want to get to heaven. <laughs> you know, I want to walk in through the... the pearly gates and sit down and have myself, you know, a nice tea with my old family and all my dead pets. And, you know, I'm not taking that away from anybody, but right here we have the definition of heaven. What is heaved up, high, high, heavy, heaved, Atlas is holding the heavens on his shoulders. They're heavy, you know, they're heaved up. It took great effort. And we're going to get into the bodies that God puts into the sky, the planets, and there's nothing wrong with saying planet. I hope we didn't use anybody's trigger word there, <laughs> planet. There's nothing wrong with saying planet. Say it as much as I'd like, okay? Planet means wanderer. Wandering planet stars. means wanderer, yes, wandering star. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying those bodies in the sky are planets. But we do not live on a planet. We live on the one stationary Earth, the foundation of all foundations. Okay? Stationary. Add a boy. Geo geocentric. Confirmed. So, firmament. Let's just get a little imagery here. What does firmament mean? Well, expanse. If you think about void and vacuum, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So he divided the up from the down, it seems. Up from down is all heaven and earth, denotes in that very first sentence. 
But when we come back down to verse 8, and God called the firmament heaven, well, the firmament are now being identified, is now being identified as uh, with heaven itself. So moving on, we're going to see why uh, that little light is flashing on the screen there. What this imagery, you know, I, I hope helps you visualize. Verse 9, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So now we have dry land. So originally, earth did not mean dry land in that first sentence. It may have, but it wasn't defined as dry land. So you have up and down. That's all that's being established in the very first sentence. And that's revealed later on. So verse 9, the dry land appears out of the water. Under the heaven, gather together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Now, I've got to throw it in there because we don't know where the first land was, what it was, whether it's hundreds of feet beneath our feet or, uh, you know, still sticking up on a mountain range today. We don't know. So where could it have been? Did you know up until about the 1980s, 90s, it was common to hear that the Appalachian Blue Ridge Mountains, southeastern United States, was the oldest landmass who have ever, ever existed. Where did that derive from? Sorry? Where did that derive from? I, I'd never heard that. The most, I'm no geologist, but the most obvious evidence for this is that the Appalachians are old. The Appalachian and Blue Ridge Mountains are old, older than the Himalayas. The Himalayas are still growing up. They're clean. They're rock that is still bursted up out of the ground. And you know, you can differ on how mountains originate, but the Appalachians are falling in upon themselves, crumbling, and they've crumbled low enough to where they are all fall beneath the vegetation line, like 99%, you know. I don't think they have any snow-capped mountains permanently in the Appalachians because they all, it's crumbled in upon itself the whole range, and it is, the granite is so old in some of those places that it has the consistency of putty, or the granite, the sheer, the hard bedrock has almost melted and crumbled and rotted in on itself. That's how old this mountain range is. And you don't see that very often in mountain ranges. So you could say that's an American-centric bias but look it up the appalachian mountains the blue ridge mountains smoky mountains southeast united states are considered the oldest landmass on earth there is only one other mountain range that they believe is older i think it's called the greenstone belt could be wrong but it's in africa south africa now that's an Afro afrocentric bias right there and i think that's evident uh, they replaced the Appalachians as the oldest somewhere around the 80s and said, no, 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 it's actually this mountain range in Africa that's the oldest. And everything comes from Africa, of course. Right. And that would Not support the out of Africa theory. And then from there, Darwinism. Yep. So. And, and Pangea theory. Mm -hmm. Because if the southeastern United States is the oldest landmass in the world, uh, it wasn't connected to Africa. It wasn't connected to, uh, you know, it was independently developed, established before other land masses may have popped out of water. Who knows? I'm not going to pretend I was there, <laughs> but I think the Bible's a reliable guide. So, do you, do you have a de origin for the word Appalachian? Apple of Eden, sure. Apple. Apollo. Apollo. Apple. Apple. Yeah, it's right in there. Alpha. You know, Appa means great or grand or grandfather. Appa. Um, Appaloosa. Appa. Appa. Alacha. Appa. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, moving on. And God 
Here, we'll bring this down. This was, that wasn't relevant until later, my bad. <laughs> but, um... It's all good. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. So, also, seas. Seas are established here. So what was the waters to begin with? Seaweed. If, if God, if God created the seas, around verse ten, what were the waters in verse one or two? Excuse me. Wasn't a sea. Wasn't just an ocean, and then boom, land came out of it. So we're not saying this was just an empty oceanic expanse, and then the Appalachian Mountains popped out. There's really a lot of ways you can interpret interpret what? that. Would the oceanic expanse be outside of, per se, a dome or a system, you know, that a lot of the uh, the, yeah. f- the flat folk uh, believe in? Yeah, I've got the, I've got the smartest, uh, smartest um, uh, subscribers here. Adam Weber, I caught that comment. Very good. Apo, what, what language is this? I'd like to know. I'm with you here. This is a good connection. Apo means out. Latia means lake. I know Latia means lake. La, wow. you know, many languages. Latia means like out of the water. It could mean that's a good connection. Whoa. I'd like to know. Fill us in a little more, Adam. Adam himself. Adam. Wife named Eve. He's giving us the details. So, here we've got some uh, tips too. God's node. Thanks for the 10 bucks. People say, as above, so below, as within, so without. Buy it all into astrology yet reject literal meaning possibilities. Heaven, earth, light, dark, water above, below. He tipped again. Another $10. Thank you, man. Heaven, earth, light, dark, water, above, below. Earth, seas. Okay, I see what you mean. Heaven and earth, light and dark, water above and below, earth and seas, herbs and trees, greater and lesser, oh, greater and lesser light, day and night, sea life and birds, insect and animal, man and male and female. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. There's a there's a dual nis, dual nature to God, and you could even say that's why Dio, Dio, Duo, is how he's how he's named in many languages. Dio, God, D I O is close, if not identical, to Duo. Deity two, deity two. Yep, and also the devil. To, you know, dare I say to divide, mm. devil, divide. The DVD. dielectric, the dielectric, which would be field theory. Diablo. Sure. Yeah. Diablo. <laughs> so, 11, verse 11 here. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth, yeah. How do you interpret uh, the grass? What's your personal interpretation of that? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I I thought so. I suspected that. I don't know. That's why we liken it to grass. That's why we use the word grass. It's the original green. Mm -hmm. But I know I'm only dumb only teasing there. But And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. You know, when when ground gets disturbed, what's the first thing that that's, pops up, right? Your yeah. grass, your little grasses, and mm-hmm. you could say weeds, but a weed could be a little grass that's not supposed to be there, or a little herb that's not supposed to be there. So grass is usually, when I see big piles of earth thrown up, um, yo, that dog's annoying. Who is, is that you, Spence? Thank you. <laughs> Um, 
in show these people are on the door. Oh, there's people at the door. I was going to say the yeah. last person who commented, I was really feeling what they were laying down because when you were talking about how, uh, you know, the firmament is heaven, I'm immediately thinking of astrology and I'm thinking to myself when man is aligned with the stars, that's when he's like prime time kicking ass essentially when it's like that 3d uh, printer, you know, and, you, and you're in alignment here on earth with the stars. Yep. That's fucking, that's like, yep. We're going to connection. We're going to expound on that. When God creates man in his image, mm -hmm. in his own image. So verse 12 and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit. The seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Okay. So days not clearly established in length yet duration. We have maybe the separation between night, between light and dark, but we don't have our 24 hour day being laid out yet. So the third day is not necessarily you know, what is that? 72 hours? Please don't limit ourselves to that. That could be the case, but that's not the explicit interpretation. The explicit, literal interpretation is that the day, 24 hours, the sun going up and down, does not exist yet. Not existent yet. So this is not a 24 hour period. Huh. So when, when people when people laugh at Christians and laugh at people and say, hey, you believe the universe was created in six days? No, it sounds like you do. It sounds like you idiots do. <laughs> Not the Christians who know what they're talking about. Okay. How many Christians cool. talk like you're talking right now, though? Not about enough. that. How many Not would enough, respond right? in your manner? I don't know. I don't you know, you. whatever. You. The Bible's there for everyone. You. It's, it's there for everyone. Yeah. This is um, why we need this. This is why we need this, man. This is why we need more advanced. I got I got to move somewhere, guys. Sorry. I got, I got the neighbor dog just barking at a lizard or something. Oh, yeah. Silly dog. So, it looks like I'm holding it down while yeah. Dr. Narco Longo changes location, and so does... Spencer. No, just oh, he's back. Plug, All right. Pl plug in my laptop in. Cool. Um, okay. So third day, but we're not, you know, we're not tripping out over this. Oh, 72 hours. How do you fit all that in? You know, uh, no, this is mythological. You've got to open, open that third eye up a little bit. Definitely. Open the, open your damn chops up. Okay. Put down the fucking pork sandwich. Put down the, be put down the beer. Okay, take a sip of some orange juice, get some sun on your face, get your feet on the bare ground, one of those things. And this will make a little bit more sense. Okay, if you're still stuck in fifth grade Bible class, I can't help you. Okay, if Father, Father Henry yelled at you too much, I don't care. Not my problem. Okay, if your ex was religious and was a piece of trash. Not my problem. You know, your your issue to sort out. Don't attribute don't attribute it to religious, you know, to being religious. Blah blah blah. And also people get so triggered by religion, the word religion. If you want to if you want to hear the most pretentious paragraph you've ever heard, uh, find someone and ask them what they think about religion. Who's not Christian or not, you know, Muslim. Oh well, boom, you'll get the most flat. Textbook AI derived uh, response, universal. I, trust me, you'll get the most universal scripted response. Well, you know, religion is just kind of constrictive, and you know, I don't like how people take God and and twist it. And well, who's twisting? Who's twisting your arm? You know, why is this such a trigger word? Jesus warned against congregations and preachers. So why are we getting duped? It's not the Bible's fault. It's not Jesus' fault. Okay. So 
Oh, and we talk about the Bible on this channel. We talk about the Bible. Any of the truths that come along with the Old World Florida were made possible by a devout, you know, wholehearted, vegetarian, holistic belief in the Bible, in Jesus. So you take that to the bank, you know, we'll see who's actually being duped here. Moving on, evening in the morning with the third day. Yes, that does get me riled up because people say that's one of the main arguments used against Christianity is six day creation is impossible. And you'll hear Richard Dawkins and all these people, Christopher Hitchens, just go on and on with a big dick in their mouth the entire <laughs> time. Just rattling off nonsense about how six days of creation couldn't have happened. And yes, they'll put up the most dweebish, you know, opponents to them who are on board with a strict, strictly literal, strictly, what's that? 24 times six. Someone help me out. What's 24 times six? Is that 144? I, I grew up with a calculator. Yeah. I think it's 144. Six times four is 24, yep. right? Six times 20 is 100. Yeah. Okay. So 144. <laughs> Dude, these people, people are funny. Yeah. And I could see like a business professional being like, oh, really? Seven days? I can't even complete my TPS reports in seven. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> they're super linear and like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for hearing it all out, guys. We're all here. We're just looking for uh, looking for some truth, and the Bible's got a lot of it. So don't discount anything. I'm an apologist, admittedly. I just want everyone to give the Bible a chance, at the very least. Distill every, extract every bit of truth you can out of it. Even if you, you know, are completely against it, you are limited to one interpretation, just give it a chance. It's cool. Nothing to get triggered over. Are we any are we any better than the blue haired chubby baristas? Yes. Getting triggered over being misgendered. If we're triggered over words like religious, if we're triggered over the Bible and think the Bible is like the the uh, you know worst thing to ever happen to to the world. Some people some people believe that narrative, unfortunately. So, okay. Moving on. Third day, evening and morning with the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Okay, guys, this is some uncomfortable territory for your everyday Baptist church, for your everyday, you know, Catholic uh, mass. This is uncomfortable territory, because this is dangerously close to ask astrology okay ruling over the day ruling over the night hang on wait the the sun rules something the moon rules something i thought god ruled everything well god creates the sun and the moon and clearly they're extensions of him his design so we're not saying worship the sun worship the moon any more than you would worship the whole of nature as the manifestation of God in the material world. Nice. But the sun is here and the moon is here. God's, again, like our tipper uh, you know, pointed out before, this is coming in twos. It's coming in mirrored proportions. It's coming in a masculine and a feminine, an above and a below. And right there, what you're looking at on the screen is how a light may come to begin. 
how a star may come to begin. This is what's called sonoluminescence. A star in a jar. Sound can spark light in a vacuum. Very good. So here we can see stars. Look up sonoluminescence, star in a jar on YouTube. If you want to see something, you know, take a little side trip and see how stars may spontaneously start, begin, are born. Now, I think our, star, our stars are very old, and I think they're as old as reality itself and, and matter itself. But how they can be sustained, how they're blinking and, and burning, shining, twinkling, this is a cymatic cause, a cymatic event in a vacuum in the heavens. Can, can I throw something about the stars and the planets just from my personal observation? Yeah. They seem to be completely different styles of light. So if you're to look at the stars through a telescope or even, you know, you can see sometimes, you know, zoom in with the P900s or the P1000s, whatever. They're like, they're like shining beautiful colors and they're vibrant and they're all moving and flashing. And sometimes it's like organized, structured flashing, but it's always uh, structured movement and flashing and colors. But when it came to the planets, they were steady, stagnant lights. And I remember when I was microdosing one time, I was just like, oh, those are boring. Like they were like a boring dead floodlight compared to the stars. And I'm just throwing that out there that I thought the stars were absolutely beautiful, sober, not sober, you know, as soon as I got into a telescope. But then when I looked at the planets, I was like, they're just little stiffies. Like it just wasn't as I wasn't drawn to them like I was. Yeah, the well, they're they're in between. You bring up a good point is that. The star, the planets, the wandering stars are in between the fixed stars, the lesser stars scattered all across the sky, and the sun. They're an in between. Okay. And the sun is very static, it, it's very stationary, and you know, it's moving through the sky, but just in terms of it doesn't spin, it doesn't really, you know, glimmer or flicker or, or like, uh, twinkle like your stars do right if you zoom in on it with the filter where you get the whole picture you know dare i say it looks almost lifeless and dead and just a orange orb and that's right. because you're seeing it's consistent and fixed and sturdy it's not twinkling it's not mutable it's not wavering the sun is permanent and fixed and established and the planets are in between. So the planets are, you know, you could say, you could call it stiff. I could call it, you know, statuesque. Mm -hmm. They're imposing. Now, I will they're say present. that when they line up, though, when the Unwavering. planets are aligned, they're very energetic. Though. They affect, they seem to affect people and even myself now that I'm more aware of myself. The planets, when they were aligned, I was affected almost like a full moon effect, like that drastic of a change. I could feel it, experience it a little bit more than normal. So it's not like I'm just saying, oh, they're nothing. You know, they're wandering stars and they're meaningless to me. But I, I noticed that I was not drawn to them then. And then, but when they aligned, that's a whole different story. There was powerful energy. You know, some people are drawn to some things. But to me, they are beautiful, glorious, Jupiter especially. Yeah. Uh, twinkles, you know, washes over my nervous system. If I really fixate on it, you can yeah. feel warmth, a buzz, a presence from Jupiter. It's, it's got to be the most obvious next to the, to the sun. You know, the sun itself, everyone can feel the moon being next mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, being obviously having an effect on the body. You bask in moonlight, you feel it. Venus and Jupiter are up there, though. They are so bright. Venus is, yes, um, you know, ever-present in the night sky. And, yeah. So, let's, well, let's get moving on. We got a lot to get through here. What were you going to say? Oh, um, when you get when you start talking about you know the sun and the moon in Genesis, um, it just reminds me of Enoch. And I don't know, do you are you for or against? Do you enjoy Enoch and the 
relation to creation and Genesis or no? You know, I always say to people, when people ask about uh, books taken out of the Bible, mm -hmm. it's again, it's not something to get, don't want to use the word too much, not something to get triggered over or concerned over. My right. favorite, my favorite movies ever have had glorious, wonderful scenes trimmed out of them. You've, something has to hit the cutting room floor. Okay, it's, it's just a matter of writing something and bringing something to publication. Something has to hit the cutting room floor. Alan, can you agree? You've written oh a book. God, you know, time. yeah. There's every, you want to fit everything. You you want to you want to fix and detail every you want to shade every little detail in in the story but you can't always you know some of my favorite movies would and i use this analogy a lot some of my favorite movies were hated by their directors because the studio came in and said hey you know we're not restricting you creatively it's just it can't be fucking four hours it's got to be yeah. two and a half hours you know it's got to be a book you can pick up. And the Old Testament was already big. The New Testament, you know, is, is not as big. But it's got to be a big book you can hold in your hand. And it, everything's out there, by the way. You can go read the Apocrypha. You can read the Book of Enoch and all these things. But it's not in the Holy Bible from the King James Version. But that's nothing to be worried about. They're out there. Just be grateful that they're available to you today in this age. To everyone, you can go read them. If you feel the need to add them, we carry a King James Version Bible with the Apocrypha added in. And that's, that doesn't get better than that. Awesome. So that's commercially available. You know, sometimes people think it's like a whole Harry Potter spell where they've just been ripped out of, you know, these, these old biblical texts have been ripped out of circulation and no eye will ever gaze upon them again that's not true you know it's uh it's all out there so thank you thank you thanks the good 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 you know things to clear out for people um and let them be for lights chapter chapter one verse we'll go back to 14 and god said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day. The sun is great. Clearly. And the lesser light to rule the night. The moon is lesser. You know, just by nature. Nothing to get triggered over. The moon is, is faltering, wavering. It's not as reliable as the sun. The sun is the same every day. The sun will rise every spring equinox, rise again, and the winter solstice will be born again. Well, this is you know, ever-present. It's universal. It's timeless. The sun will always rise. That is the message in Christianity. And, you know, it's not the forefront of Judaism, but it's really honed in on in Christianity is the sun will never falter. Don't let these reset people get into your head that the sun's going to go away. Oh yeah, the Illuminati is just going to turn the sun off. Oh yeah, the uh, the sun's just going to, or don't let the Neil deGrasse Tysons, Neil Disgrace Tysons, the Neil Disgrace Tyson chicken, chicken nuggets get to you, okay? <laughs> it's, uh, Whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Moving on. Longo, I got to um, mention something because this is so huge. And I made a fucking huge connection. Yeah. God said, let there be light, meaning sound. And you said yeah. something earlier that sound can generate light. Yep. That's spoke substantial. Things. That's what we're looking at. We're looking spoke at spoke things into existence. You're on it, Alan. All over. Yeah. It. But that's like. When you when you think about that, God said, "Let there be light," and then we see the stars that are light, and then you the parallel of sound can become light. It's like yep. whoa. That's, that's what light. we're looking at. That's what know, we're looking at on the screen right here is is a star in the jar. Exactly. Light what is, being. 
Mm-hmm. What is it? What, I, I'm sorry. What is Star in the Jar? I look at the stars and I see them as lights and I love it. Mm-hmm. Can you just like the basic synopsis of Star in the Jar is sound to light in a miniature so, yeah. experiment? You can do this in a vacuum. I think yeah. th- I think they used water as the medium, okay. which is which is further evidence, but I'm not I'm not for sure. It's either a bubble of water or one water molecule. I'm not not exactly sure, but basically in a vacuum they can compel light to appear out of nothing. Wow. With sound. Yeah. And this is one of those truths of science that is just a, a obvious proof of creator of a spark in nature that is unlocked through music frequency all the pretentious things that hippies list off in their instagram and tiktok reels but it's all true people unfortunately that's where i came onto the scene that's where i finally started finding faith and understanding more of what you know, some the the few interpretations in scripture that I knew and heard on repeat, I'm like, oh, well, that's what that would mean from my understanding. So what you just said is exactly where I started. And even Tesla, um, you know, had, you know, his famous quote was, uh, light can be nothing more than a sound vibration in the ether. And so literally Tesla was telling you, light is sound. What is light? If you look at the light spectrum, you know, here's green out in front of us and you have your chakras, the green color is in the center. And when you look out, you know, around us, we have green at the plane of inertia of a, an electromagnetic field. And light is to me a field. So that's why I studied field theory and what light is and what sound is. And then everything the hippies talk about is right, like Longo saying, you know, but it's, it, it's not something to worship and obsess over. But once you understand it, that's how I was like, oh, shoot, now I can actually start paying a tech attention to scripture and not feel like the uh the uh the the excuse me overweight you know disgusting finger pointer at the church i I don't have to you know feel bad for ignoring him now i have you know more more enlightenment before i start listening and trying to interpret and understand things but that was huge for me too alan right there what you just said so shall yeah love it verse 16 and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Boom. Sun, moon, stars in the heavens. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. To give light upon the earth. I think that implies that the moon's light is uh, independent, innate. It's, it's unique to the moon. It's not the mere reflection of the sun. Now, as for the phases, yes, that is the reflection of the sun. But as for why that moon is cooling and moistening and white rather than yellow, bluish rather than a yellow ray, that is due to this, you know, it's lesser. It's cooling, it's wavering. Some would say the moon is putrefying, that it, it, it fosters rotting. And, you know, if you have a wound, most wounds don't leave it in moonlight because it's actually it does it's not infectious by nature but it will read infection because it's not heating drying and and uh you know sunlight is the best disinfectant so moonlight is opposed to that by nature so you can fill in the blank so moonlight is independent and unique we don't we don't want to dwell on that too long because there's there's other interpretations to that i literally have my blankets and pillowcases disinfecting on the trampoline in the sun right now it's crazy you said that nice 18 verse 18 and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and god saw that it was good so here day and night up until now had not been established it had not been defined it had not been ironed out what that timekeeping system was so the days are simply periods of time they might not be the same period of time um, you know apart from each other they may be eons these could be you know dimensions got you know He's rising a dimension. He's adding a dimension to himself, adding a new 
layer of light to the creation, you could interpret that different ways. But hey, have a field day with it. You know, it's it's poetic. And moving on to rule over the day and over the night. Well, that's astrological. The sun rules over something and the moon rules over something. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fourth, sorry, were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. So this cattle right now may not mean cow, like a domesticated cow. This could have been what they call the auruch, auruch, A-U-R-U-C-H, I think, or A-U-R-O-C-H. This like a primordial, you know, early pre-ice age uh, bull. It's almost like a longhorn, almost like a Texas longhorn, super trippy, big, big horns. They pull those up all the time. Um, yes, even in the United States. In Florida, there's there's prehistoric cattle. Not cows, not, you know, tamed by man. At least not for sure, we don't know. But prehistoric, pre-Ice Age, bovine animals who developed into cows elsewhere. So, boom. Whales, birds, cows creatures of the field and verse 24 and God said let the earth bring forth a living creature after his kind cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind and it was so and God made the beasts of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and God saw that it was good now what we're seeing here is why evolution formed itself the way that it did in opposition to Christianity, solely as an affront to Christianity. What they're saying is that there is no kind. Any animal can spawn out of any randomness, out of any haphazard mutation, beneficial or not, can take a new shape and evolve, even though you've never seen it with your own eyes, even though it can never be replicated in a in a um, uh, in a laboratory, they can introduce new strains of bacteria all they want, and yeah, they get familiar with new disinfectants, but they don't turn into spaghetti. They don't turn into toads. You get what I mean? Like, yes, you can have bacteria rearrange itself, and you know, it recode itself to respond to disinfectants and, and different. Um, antibiotics but it's still bacteria <laughs> it's not going anywhere right this is this is like the main present readily presented evidence against uh, Christians when Christians say well there's no evidence of evolution you can't replicate revolution or show it um, there's no there's no intermediate species to fill the gaps between all the different species and all the different continents or to explain why there's a common framework to all the species around in different continents well um so with yeah. evolution man, we're, here, I, we're here i yeah my train sorry one, okay go one ahead sec there's the train um <laughs> the <laughs> evolution is pre is preoccupied fixed on destroying the concept of kind that goat is just a goat because it happened to mutate into that form and oh it worked out 
And it's been like that for a couple million years. Well, the bacteria in the Petri dish doesn't show anything when it responds to an antibiotic. It doesn't show a leap from one species to the next. There are no intermediate species. There's snail, raccoon, bear, all of these things millions of years back. Fossils, fossilized all across the earth. There's species that live in those places right now, fossilized. What they tell us is strata from hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago. And evolution theory makes going after kind or species, as they would call it, you know, genus, whatever, that species can change genus. Well, we all know that animals reproduce after their kind. You can slap a lion and a sorry a lion and a tiger together, and it'd be like, it made a liger. <laughs> that didn't prove anything. Still, it's kind. Still the kind. The horse and the zebra. Still a kind. The buffalo, the bison, and the European cattle, which mixed. Still the same kind. So nothing is leaping those boundaries. Nothing's escaping its kind. That's about like a, what God is adamant. Platypus? Sorry? What about the duck-billed platypus? That one really messes me up sometimes. You know, yeah, there's some interesting theories with Lemuria I'm, and the Pacific, and that's okay. I understand. Hey, throw a wrench into any, any, you know, any hole in the argument should be brought to light because yeah. no, I just think it's, it's funny. Okay. They have freaking eggs. Yeah, it's the strangest yeah. thing on earth. Like, mm -hmm. I was gonna say real quick about um, evolution. What it does, it sort of traps people in this linear way of thinking we're, we're, we're constantly evolving we're not cyclical don't don't think that way oh, we're constantly yeah. evolving in space travel also this concept of space travel also ensnares people within what i call the myth of progress where we're always progressing and history is linear and it's not cyclical and that's that's what i think is the core of uh, evolution because once you got people on this linear mindset you wow. can steer them so okay yep. So nice. nice, Alan. When we get to verse 20, sorry, overweight. Oh, when you get to verse 25, we're going to see things start, you know, speeding up here a little bit. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind. And everything that creepeth upon the earth was after his kind. Facts. No cap to be found, brah. Straight facts. Okay? And God made... I already said, already said that. Verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, in his own image, male and female. Spencer, you may have your answer to your earlier you know, question. God clearly includes male and female. Because in this instance, we don't have a male before male, male before female. You have both of them being created in man's in god's image and yeah. you know I, I hope that satiates the feminists i hope i hope that uh quenches the yeah that that the, right there. the illusion dispels the illusion that uh women or femininity is trampled on by the bible which is a, a notion i reject and it's superstition added on to the bible by weak thinkers who've seen too much TikTok. Usually. I just want to, before I lose this train of thought, you just named the, like the grazers, the fish and the birds. The, they gave dominion. They gave man dominion over. Yes. All right. So this is where, when I was studying law and they were utilizing 
they were explaining why the Bible is so powerful in courtrooms. And they were explaining why, why ecclesiastical law is so powerful. And you had to go back to the origins of canon and all types of stuff like that, which was very advanced for me just popping in. But you just named the land, the air, and the water, which is law. And so God gave me man dominion over the land, the air, and the water right there is kind of where it's spelled out. And those are the jurisdictions, you know, the, you know, property, equity, and rights land is the land and soil jurisdiction. Then you have the law of the sea, maritime admiralty is this contract law. And then you have the air would be the ecclesiastical law. And so a lot of people, you know, ha have no idea that there's people that literally interpret uh, they or sorry, they use the Bible as a trust indenture for law, even in international high level supreme and superior courts. Wow, it's the best lawyer you could ask for is the the Bible. Still works until this day. As a reason you swear in to a Bible, and you know many states they still stick a Bible out, and they'll ask you if you want a Bible. Um, here, let me get my Bible. Public law uh, 97 210 um, shows that the, the Constitution was created utilizing the King James 1611. They, they used references from the, uh, the, the spoken trust indenture of the Bible for where, their construction of the Constitution. If you ever look it up. Yep. Wow. On the OP. So when we see God creating man in his image, well, let's just let's touch on dominion, okay, and get ready for for a triggered vegan rant here, okay, guys. Arm, <laughs> armor, armor up, bunker, you know, bunker down. Um, you know, someone might, some people might catch some strays here, but uh, God gave us dominion over the animals. Dominion, meaning, if I need to get from point A to point B, that horse is going to take me. We were given dominion over nature. We give purpose to nature beyond bestial reproduction and feeding and just, we give purpose and order and shape and direction to nature. Beauty. Now, now do we, you know, miswield that, that responsibility? Of course we do. I'll scold any person I see uh, chopping down a tree they don't need to, kicking around an animal they don't need to, or littering. And by the way, all litterers are drinkers, if not most of them. You know, don't don't uh, grill me on the <clears throat> on the uh, statistics, but I'd wager ninety percent of litter come from drinkers. Hmm. Drinkers chuck their stuff. Drinkers are far more likely to be litterers. It's a fact. It's evident. We've all lived it and seen it. People who get together and drink at the corner of town or, you know, at the end of the road that goes to nowhere and get their cars together, just leave their shit everywhere. It's always drinkers at the beach who leave their shit all over the place. Okay. It's evident. Just a little thing here, but God gave us dominion over the animals. Dominion. Hey, if I need to go point A to point B, the horse is going to take me. If that plow's too heavy for me to push or pull, the, the cow's going to help me. The buffalo's going to help me. If I'm too cold in the winter, the lamb has plenty, the sheep has plenty to offer. Right? If, yeah. I'm, if I am cut off from my family in another land, that bird is there and designed and willing. This is all willing, by the way. The cow yearns to pull the plow and to help watch the farm take form to help you know help be the architect of the farm they love to take part in this greater plan animals do you know when your dog spencer i'm sure you know when your dog gets an idea of your schedule they want to take part in it so badly oh yeah uh, cows are like that too so you get cows in a routine they want to see you every day that being said they love they love exercising my cats, uh, they love exercising their strengths, their talents. Horses love to run fast. Dogs love to lead the way, you know, and scare off the snakes ahead of the trail for the for the humans. Uh, to, if Absolutely. there's an enemy down the trail, the dog will see it first. If 
there's a threat down the trail, the dog will see it first. Dogs love to lead. Okay. Every animal has a place in nature, not only in nature, but in the man of, in the life of man. I got my cats are getting hungry. But um, hey, real real quick, long one sec. You guys a, talk. Yeah, give me a sec. Alan. Yep. Is it God made man in our image or His image? Do you know uh, His image? And dude, I was okay. about to say that is such it's such a powerful mindset. So let's let's think about somebody who grows up thinking, okay, I was made in God's image. That's a higher mindset. That's going to be somebody who has a higher self-esteem and who is less susceptible to tricks of medical cartels, right? Sure. If I if I genuinely in my heart of hearts I believe, okay, I was I was made in God's image. I'm not going to take your bullshit that I don't want to take. I'm going to partake in, you know, the fruits of creation, right? I'm going to um and be enthusiastic about it and be healthier. So like the thing about being made in God's image, it's so important. And you see how it's directly opposed to this idea of evolution, right? Because yep. within the evolution mindset, oh, my ancestors were monkeys yep. who came from a fucking swamp uh, because before that there were frogs mm -hmm. and before that there were bacteria in a fucking pond in Tanzania, right? That's like the worst possible mindset, man. The, and that, that is where when people say, well, why the lie when you come to like flat earthers, you get to here when you start explaining. It's like, hey, it's about being disconnected from, you know, the cosmology plays into exactly what you just said. Yeah. And that, that's where you're disconnecting from God. And so it's, it's like. It, it's like if you have the big C, for example, I don't like saying the word for the algorithms, yep. I don't yep. know. but, but um, if you have that, for example, that's your body protecting itself. You don't need that. Your body is already doing, it's wired to heal. We are literally created to heal. We have the most divine wiring and engineering of all the most divine wiring. And I don't need man. I don't need this corporate construct and synthetic chemically altered nonsense to heal there is a natural instinctive healing process already happening that you're calling bad my divine healing process that's already happening which it whether it's bound and wound up and sitting here in a lump if you have a lump here and it's sitting here that's your body already doing divinely it's trying to keep it localized so it's not spreading throughout your whole body yeah. if you have a fever oh we gotta we gotta lower that fever no your fever is raising to kill what is happening to take out what's happening your fever is actually what's healing you everyone thinks that all of this divine these divine reactions are so bad they demonize divine reactions in the human body when it's actual like hey that's literally what you're designed to do stop if you stop that now you're going to require a drug to heal from this because you removed your natural divine defense systems for all this nonsense. Once you're like, the more connected you are to God and creation and frequency and vibration, even to the point where you're not smelling and breathing and toxins and fumes and all that stuff, and you're just, you're, or you're able to transmute bad energies. Say you have all this nasty sound, but you can be at peace and you can stay calm in a bad environment. That's you transmuting into what you're d designed to, to, to and wired to be. When you're connected to that, you, you can you can co accomplish anything. And when you know you're made in that image, you're not nothing. You're not coming. You're not this little speck in an expanse. You're not this tiny little thing. No, we are the center of the universe, and we're designed to you know be. And we are in that image. Yeah, sorry, I agree. <laughs> Huge. Yes, substantial. And Longo might like this as he puts his headphones back on. When people litter, the only trash is them. You know. Facts. Mm -hmm. Big yep. <clears throat> you're not creating any trash you're only ex exposing trash when you litter dude it, it was funny i talked to these cops um in hampton beach right and the one thing that pisses them off is littering like they hate litterers at at this beach so it's interesting yeah i can see it um, so we were given dominion over the animals, guys. <clears throat> we were not given a menu with animals on it. In the Garden of Eden, man was a vegan, vegetarian, fruitarian, perhaps. Fruitarian, but also the herb bearing seed. Plants, leaves, roots. 
herb bearing seed and fruit bearing seed. So unadulterated, unhybridized, un GMO'd seeds present. You know, you poop out the seeds, you further the lifestyle of the food that you're eating. You further the lifestyle of the tree that the fruit came from. You are partaking in God's act by creating and furthering life. Consuming, you're consuming, but you're not uh, devouring, if that makes sense. And when you eat flesh, you devour. Nothing comes of it. What, a larger bicep? Your, you know, your neck veins stick out a little more? It's, uh, it's folly. Well, man was given dominion over the animals, and dare I say, that includes responsibility. We're the protectors of the animals. Okay. Yeah. In the original Garden of Eden, man was a holistic fruitarian who loved herbs and leaves and greens and had no extravagant wants of other things. Truly. So, when you go to dominion, God did not give the leopard dominion over its prey. Every Christian must come to terms with this. God did not give the leopard dominion over his prey. God did not give the Florida cougar dominion over its prey, nor the alligator, nor any of it. That is its function in nature, to devour, to quell, to trim. That's the ugly. It's not a ugly. It's, you know, it's majestic, but it's vicious. That's the vicious reality of nature is that, you know, you got to stay with the pack because there's always a predator nipping on your heels. There's power in the, in the pack. There's power in, you know, not isolating yourself or succumbing to to disease and getting you'll get picked off that's ever present in business you may think you we live in a modern age where you know there's no danger as well you're in a you're in a digital serengeti and there's wildebeest getting picked off left and right and spiritually if you stray from the pack and this is not the you know we're not saying mass group thinking and group thought and you know in a bad way but if you stray from the righteous Block, as God goes on to, you know, use as a uh, symbol, time and time again, you get picked off. That's why it's always the flock. You stay with the flock. Stay within the shepherd's scope. There are predators. Well, predators weren't given dominion over their prey. That's simply their natural function. And an, a, a tiger can't eat anything but dead animals and corpses. To, to deprive to deprive a flesh-eating animal of corpses is inhumane. That's what they're designed to eat. I wouldn't try to make my cats vegan. That's retarded. And any person who tries to to uh, object to veganism, saying, "Oh, well, you know, lions eat gazelles. Are they evil?" No, that's their function. You know, someone. I think you would have to. Fix your moral framework. It seems to be confused. Vegans recognize their place in nature. Vegetarianism. And, uh, you know, I use vegan. I use vegan lightly. We're not talking about your chubby, blue-haired barista ex-girlfriend with tattoos on her face. Who, you know, is down for the cricket burgers as soon as they come out. We're not talking about the beyond meat vegetarians. We're not talking about the impossible meat that plant-based factory, industrial plant-based laboratory. That's not what we're describing here. We're talking about holistic fruits, herbs. You ever see a Greek god? Yeah, honey, olives, cereals, leaves. Yeah. I think it's safe Vegans. to I think it's safe to say that the lack of understanding of energy, when you're eating, you're eating for energy. And when you understand energy, energy doesn't lie. And we were given this dominion and we are this, we have a higher consciousness. The, what, I, what I've learned over the last few years is it, it's the lack of knowledge and the lack of wisdom that keeps people from being a, not being able to do, do what they used to do or what we were supposed to be doing, the veganism. Yeah. 
And so it's yeah. a lack, it's a lack of intelligence and not understanding energy. Energy doesn't lie. And when you understand creation and God, you'll realize that there are better, more efficient ways for you to be gaining energy and for your circuits to be clear. If you are drinking things that cause mucus, you just created electrical impedance. Now your body isn't firing beautifully. Your DNA is an antenna. This electrical system, when you're not grounded, your body's not communicating perfectly. You're building up too much static charge. So all of these things that we're not doing, we are not standing and flowing water. We're not drinking living water. We're drinking water that actually depletes us energetically. We're doing a million things that remove energy from us, not to mention the ones that govern us have you know, psychologically just tricked us into being so not, you know, so dependent on their systems that we have no clue that there are other ways to get energy and that we would not require as much at all whatsoever or the government systems of energy if we just looked to the old world and the scripts and understood God and energy. Yeah. So guys, dominion over animals does not include devouring them. That can never be used as a justification ever for consuming animals. By the way, humans don't eat living corp living animals. Flesh-eating animals, true predators, eat living corpses. They wrestle them to the ground and drain them of their blood while they're still alive. And they revel in that adrenochrome trip. And they love it. And it's addicting. They lust over blood. The The sensation of blood hitting their tongue can only be likened to mango nectar hitting a human's tongue such fine tuning to your exact taste that you wouldn't want to taste anything else the finest fruit juice dropping onto your tongue is what blood in the mouth of a lion can be likened to no man can say they fall under that category. Blood is tasteful. Most cultures go through extreme methods of, you know, altering it before they consume it. Excuse me. We're close, sir. We're close. Okay. Fucking people go in the side door like it's their fucking house. Um, I'm going to get in. Basically, dominion is responsibility and a place in our dealings. A place in our dealings. I saw a comment about canine teeth. I hope we're, you know, I hope we all have eyes and mirrors to, to see. Humans do not have canine teeth. Humans do not have canine teeth. Humans have a little tiny bit of a, you know, what, edge point? The two of their teeth, four sometimes. Um, have you ever seen what a canine is like? It's a fang. Our teeth are closest to horse. Even monkeys who eat fruit all day and bats who don't eat flesh have big, sharp fangs. So even fangs don't tell you anything. Fangs, you know... Canines do not tell you anything. Our canines are not canines. Case closed. I mean, isn't that obvious? They're called canines, but they're not suited at all for tearing flesh. You couldn't even eat a squirrel if you tried to. I, I challenge you. Eat a squirrel with your bare hands and call yourself a predator. Call yourself top of the food chain. So, we have dominion over nature. But we are not meant to consume corpses. Really, nothing's meant to consume corpses except hyenas and vultures. Why would man partake in the diet of vultures and hyenas? We are not even courageous enough to eat it as it's killed. Living, living blood, living flesh, a pumping heart. That's what you're really after if you're a predator, after all. Well... I don't think anyone's up to that challenge. Nobody wants to stick their face into the gore like a predator does. Nobody wants to drain down the blood, guzzle down the blood like a predator does. If I fill a bowl up with blood right now, my cat will drink it dry. The only man I know who'll drink that dry 
is liver king. Maybe Paul Saladino. A couple, a couple, a couple uh, rabbis here and there. Maybe, you know, a couple uh, Aboriginal, you know, witch doctors who you wouldn't want to meet ever in your life might guzzle down that blood. But no civilized man would guzzle down blood and go kiss his family. Never. Only out of extreme deprivation, extreme circumstance, does a man compel himself to consume flesh and blood. So dominion is responsibility. We're meant to tame the elephant. I'm not with these PETA losers. I'm not with these guilt-tripping vegan, you know, animal uh, abolitionists who say no animal should ever, no horse should ever be ridden again. There's people that believe that. P PETA puts stuff out like that. That's nonsense. That's eco-terrorism. That, that's just attacking. That's equally, equally offensive to the Bible. So we're not saying factory meat. We're not saying plant vegan fake meat. That stuff's garbage. We're not talking about PETA and liberating every single animal from having a duty on the farm. That's nonsense. But we are called to a clean diet. A clean, fruit-heavy, herb-heavy, leafy green, leafy green-heavy diet. Everyone should strive for that. Figs, honey, mm, honey. Don't the, don't let the vegans, vegan idiots, get in your head either. Honey's great. Honey's amazing for you. Vegan beef rub. Honey. Beef rub. Whatever. Oh, you can call it beef rub. I'll call it liquid volcanic crystal. Volcanic, oozing, magmatic, crystalline gold. That is life-preserving. It actually never goes bad because the humming of the, of the wings have, have isolated the molecules so that no impurities remain. I mean, this is divine alchemy in the trunk of a tree. And somewhat someone's going to call it bee throw up and stick their nose up at it. I know you're only joking, you know. I, love I have them. probably more. Love beef, I have more beef throw up pro in my house than yeah. probably anybody that follows. I know me. you love honey. I know, but we're addressing the naysayers out there, and those who are confused. Honey is great for the human. Honey and salt, my brother. Honey and salt changed my life, understanding the value of both. Yeah, and we're given dominion. Now, does that mean if the lamb falls dead? or the cow falls dead, we can make leather from it? Sure we can. If you're doing it, you know, righteously, if you're not <laughs> spilling blood for no good reason, you can use animal material into things. That's another vegan thing I'm not with either. You know, I'm not gonna get triggered over leather. Um, I'm not gonna get triggered over animal products. Now, that being said, I'd like it for that to be the, um, you know, natural duration of that thing's life and then it falls dead towards the end of its life. There's a whole ton of materials that are derived from animals that don't need to be youthful. They don't need to be, you know, a year old or a couple months old, like your beef that you're eating is, you know, a cow's maybe a couple of years old at the most if you're eating it. And you've got chicken that are only a couple of weeks old being bred to the size of what a couple month old chicken would have been a hundred years ago. Well, you know, everyone knows they should eat cleaner and eat better, but there is a moral element to what we eat. It is not our place in nature to consume flesh. Uh, it might be our place. In, you know, that might be an argument to be had, but it's certainly not our place in nature to consume carrion. The meat in the supermarket has been dead for days, if not weeks weeks, maybe months, maybe years. You don't know some of these countries, some of these companies. Okay. That is that is carrion. If you don't know what carrion means, look it up. Because you've got a lot of, when you're coming through the pearly gates, you're going to have a lot of carry-on luggage coming with you. And you might get turned away from the pearly gates if you are riddled with blood. If you have blood on your hands, that's the number one thing that's going to disqualify you 
from, I'm not going to say heaven, but a karmically righteous, you know, forward progression into the afterlife, the less blood, the better. Now, that being said, if Canadian paratroopers fall down on, you know, on my neighborhood, oh, it's all bets, all bets are off, you know. <laughs> humans can kill humans if they need to. Uh, this this is no message of pacifism. If I'm attacked by a lion, I'm going to try and kill that thing. Okay? You know, the sadhus of India walk around with weapons. The holy man of India walk around with big weapons, real deal smith weapons that they walk through the jungle with by themselves because at any given moment, they anticipate getting attacked by a tiger attacked by wild animal and they the sadhus of india the saints you know the the holy men the drifting you could call them hobos maybe but drifting holy men of india walk around with big tridents and weapons to defend against wild animals why because they believe negative entities negative spirits often dwell and coexist with animals that tend to prey on humans of course there's an association there. Of course there's you know good attributes to a jaguar, but if a jaguar is killing, you know, a baby um, every week, that's evil. Don't don't you know, let's call it what it is. That's an affront to human safety, to civilization. You can't have wild beasts. Wild beasts do not have dominion over man. We're on top in nature, but not on top of the food chain. We're on top and we have dominion, but not on top of the food chain. And by the way, you're eating carrion at the end of the day. You know, even even Joe Rogan out hunting all the elk. Oh, yeah, this, oh, this is prime organic. You know, heart still beating elk on my, elk on my hickory board here. Yeah. <laughs> e even that is going to get thrown in the freezer and sat on. For months nobody eats a whole deer in one sitting i've killed many things i grew up hunting by the way these insights have not come from a point of ignorance i've killed many things i have insight into what it means to be a hunter i've slaughtered tons of shit for no good reason a lot of the time now i can blame it on you know my dad raised me that way i was young and as soon as i was old enough i got out and went vegetarian but i've slaughtered a bunch of shit with a gun with knives in my backyard and uh, I, I think that's taught thing, hogs deer that's taught sorry I, I believe that's taught you know you know being in florida a florida boy my whole life when i mean i was let loose i didn't have you know church i didn't have i didn't have a lot of constructs like all my friends had but i was let loose and i noticed that all of the boys that were let loose naturally, we just killed things. Like you're saying, we slaughtered things for no good yeah. reason. I've since lost all desire. Like I, I won't even shoot a deer these days, but like I've lost all desire. Well, you know, once you start gaining some higher learning, there, there, energy doesn't lie. But back then I will say naturally, that's what we were doing. But I still looking back, think that that's programming. It's all part of social culture. We were programmed into that from our propaganda and all the books that we saw and things like that. It was pumped up. And that's why I believe we did it, not necessarily instinctually. We didn't even have testosterone yet. Our nuts didn't even drop yet. We're killing everything. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it was taught for sure. Um, I learned, you know, monkey see, monkey do. My, my yeah. dad took me hunting as as young as we could remember. Took my brother and I hunting. Yeah, man. But, I want to um, I want to talk about climate real quick. So you know, when we when we're going back in time, we're talking about you know, some of the oldest scripts there are. I've seen some of the oldest cartography portraying more tropical climates everywhere as opposed to what we have now per se. And, you know, neither here nor there. Could be wrong. All I'm saying is when people live up north, they don't have access to, you know, the lifestyle that could be a safe, uh, 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 high quality. So I think when you're in these extremely cold climates and you're in, you're in, there is no foraging, there is nothing available. You're going to be forced into a lot more of that karmic debt because you got to, you would, I mean, I could see like milks and fish being the only resources. You know what I'm saying? So I think climate yeah. plays a huge yeah. role. 
I can speak so. to that, Spence. I think um, because I have a lot of Nordic ancestry as well as you know Irish ancestry, right? Mm -hmm. So the Nordic brain starts planning for winter April first. Like even now, dude. Like I have my next nine months planned out, and within that that mindset, and uh, there isn't this um, sense of abundance that you Correct. might feel in a more tropical climate. Like oh, I can always go out and get bananas. I can always go out. It's, it's abundant. It's the mentality in cold climates is a three sixty almost from that. It's like, I got to have rations yep. or, you know, in, in the modern terms, just money or uh, logistics planned out nine months in advance. Agree. You know I mean? so. Agree. And then that's not, that's that to me, wouldn't be sound governing for man. You know, we've we've all ended up in these locations, cultures and, and, and conditioning. But for something inside me tells me that there at some point, the climate might not have been the same as it is right now. And so I, I just feel like there was at some point far more abundance uh, closer to creation, if you will. Yeah. Well, we're going to see here a mistake may have been made that triggered a change in uh, temperature, climate. Humidity, perhaps the sun's path in the sky, but let's uh, let's just go back here. You know, that's enough said about dominion, and it's just it's evident. You know, it's not my position; it's the position of every you know true biblical scholar that man was built as a vegetarian, a vegan, a fruitarian with some herbs. Well, then he fell from that. Fell from that. And I would even argue that, you know, we, we had to fall and E. e. Calloway, this is not the original fall. It's not necessarily a fall, but it's the willful um, man's willful taking part in free will. Sorry. Man's taking part in free will, conscious decision to engage in free will. And that includes desire, the temptation. Um, but. We're going to get to it. God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. This is another thing. This is going to you know, drag on forever, but subdue the earth. Hey, sorry, beaver. You got to get out of the way. We got to build this damn highway. You know, it, it's it's chip chop. You know, things got to get done. Man has a has to carve out a place in nature. And like I said before, have we wielded that that power, that responsibility? Well, always no. I'm not saying every every encroaching we make into nature is good, but we are given the right to, to do so. Unfortunately. And it's up to us to please each other, not us to assume that we shouldn't alter nature. God gives us dominion over animals and nature to carve it up. What does it say? Subdue it. The earth is wild. This is a it's a battle for survival. Even in the tropics, you feel this. Build your house and turn your back for a second. It might be overgrown. You've got to fight back the weeds. You've got to keep back the bugs. You've got to you know, you can build as good as you can. We, if we start building out of stone and using better materials, you won't have to subdue things as, you know, as it won't be as laborious to subdue things. You know, you build something good, it lasts very long. Unlike today, you do a lot of sweeping and you got fixing, cleaning your windows and the little minutia that's just so taxing on the mind and body. Um, that's kind of what these great stone temples sought to do away with was the uh, insignificant minutia of keeping things orderly. But <clears throat> subdue the earth. If man needs to get from here to there, build a highway, build a trail. If we need to get through the swamp, sorry, alligators, there's going to be a place that opens up to them elsewhere. They've got to make do elsewhere. This is, and hey, I wish we had a, an army of vegetarians, a world of only vegetarians who would adopt animals, had animal sanctuaries, and every time a building project disturbed a place, 
everyone was in it. But then again, that's a little bit of a hippie pipe dream. And the world we live in is kind of vicious. That being said, I rescue every animal I can. You know, everyone should avoid needless death as much as possible. These yeah. things are these things are evident, you know, it's it's human nature. But that being said, we are here to subdue the earth. The earth is here to get us. Mother Nature's out to get us as much as we might not like to admit it. You've got um you know, parasites in muddy water. You've got uh, lightning. You've got all these things you got to look out for. You know, you don't live a life of fear, but you've got to be reasonably alert, aware, and willing to conquer your foe. And it's not, it's not, uh, you know, indecent. It's not unbecoming of a human to consider certain elements of nature their foe. You've got to beat back the rain. You've got to keep out the cold. You've got to keep out things that are hostile to human life. And God gives us the right to do so. So these environmentalists who want man to, you know, fall by the wayside and suffer so that nature can thrive, they completely neglect to realize that man is nature. Man is nature. Man building his cities is no different than the beaver building his his dam. No different than the, you know, does the pine tree weep when the when the uh, woodpecker builds his hole in it? Probably, but it's it's dog eat dog, you could say. And there is a vicious element, and a lot of vegans and vegetarians shy away from that. But it's got to be said, there is a every man for themselves. And hey, if the ice age came. Our ancestors had to eat meat to get out of it. That's what happened. But guess what? We probably sinned and corrupted nature in order to trigger hell in winter to begin with. Yeah. And so, as we were saying before, a tropical wonderland is kind of described in the, all the golden ages of the world religions, the Garden of Eden, the Bible. It's almost like with that level of responsibility, you know, I don't want to get too hippie and environmentalist on you, but if the earth is always trying to reach homeostasis and the human body divinely created is always trying to create homeostasis, I don't think we understand energy to a level like, you know, all of the, you know, the great minds that you've described, the Schauburgers and, the, and all the great minds in your philosopher's diet. Those guys understood electrical impedance, harmonic interference. Those, those guys understood, and like you're just saying, I do think we overdo it and we have businessmen, greedy, hungry businessmen full of parasites with a gut full of flesh, if you will, adrenochrome suckers that are just obsessed with the, you know, the next materialistic thing. And so, and so I really do think that obviously, I mean, most crazy weather I think is man-made, even if it's intentional or unintentional. So, you know, if the earth's always trying to find homeostasis, I think if we understood ourselves like a tuning fork where you go are you creating chaos or disease and disease and disorder or when you show up somewhere are you bringing light to a situation do you make people feel good when you enter the room or do you make it feel awkward you know what are you bringing where you go are you a tuning fork to your environment or are you disorder and disease so when you say we're all meant for ourselves i think there's a divine law written in frequencies and light and sound and all this stuff already existing i think the law is creation and we are disconnected from it and disconnect from god and that's what creates the lack of homeostasis in the opposite uh, you know what i'm saying so i digress that's, that's yeah the word that came to mind uh for me is correspondence it's Beautiful, almost perfect. as if our own behavior and whether or not we're living in alignment with god there's a mirror response to our literal environment so if we were all, you know, in tune with nature, our environment would resemble the Garden of Eden. That's kind of what. Yeah. Well, hey, yeah, you know, 100 yeah. percent, you dog, you've got the world is heating up. They're telling us now that, might, that might not be true at all, but it's what they seem to be deathly afraid of is the world warming up. Global warming is the number one enemy, right? Oh, you mean the return to Eden? Yeah, they want to stop that dead in its tracks. Of course, yeah. they want to block out the sun and freeze the sky and have hell forever. Winter is hell. Hell is winter. Invierno, invierno. Yeah. So. Bingo. 
Let's see some uh, let's see some oranges in the chat, y'all. Who's with us on this? Who's Christian? Who's Christ curious? Who's in the triggered antichrist, you know, uh, category? Are you antichrist? I mean, who wants to be antichrist, right? And we're gonna get into some sponsors here. Yeah, we'll shout out our sponsor at the end of the at the end of the stream for the full room. But let's let's move on here. It gets interesting. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea. Yeah, we can have hatcheries. You know, maybe we can manufacture cat food with holistically, uh, I hate saying ethically, it's the most cringe word there is, but ethically sourced fish from a hatchery. You know, subdue the seas, make sure that they're functioning, make sure one species isn't dominating over the others. Nice. So to subdue the earth is to, you know, get the reins on it, have, have a reasonable control over what's happening. Don't just be a, a little caveman tribe just dodging, you know, the, oh, we're going to dodge this hurricane and then dodge this tsunami and just scraping by. No, 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 no. Carve out a place. Carve out a dominion. So, when we see dominion over the fish, that can mean a lot of things. You can use, there's a lot of fish products. There's a lot of aquaponic technologies. Um, I believe that here on this earth, in Florida in particular, that man once rode the dolphin and the porpoise as he did the horse. And he rode into battle on dolphin back and porpoise back. And that the sea cows, like those in Florida, the manatees, have an ancient, ancient uh, you know, role in humanity's life. Here and making uh, bringing agriculture to the sea, to the seabed. You know, there's cabbage under the, the manatees eat cabbage that grows on the seabed. Well, you can see how manatees could have been used to uh, till the seabed, to to pull, to just like cows, um, they call them sea cows. Yeah, they're sea cows to uh, tow things down rivers. I mean, we're, we're completely neglecting this whole half of nature, what's in the water as far as taming them. You know, we, we all see what dolphin trainers can do with dolphins. Why can't every human have a dolphin? Isn't that the best way to bring back their population? Every human should be able to have a pet dolphin and put them out in the sea and they can fend for themselves and then, hey, we'll go meet you at Go meet you in the backyard, have a place on the water, you know. Fucking, why can't every family have a dolphin? Bro, that was one of my favorite shows growing up. I'm showing my age, but Flipper was one of my favorite shows as a kid. Humans are deprived of aquatic pets. You get a goldfish, a fighting fish. So what? Who cares? You know how much they regulate turtles and dolphins? And I'm not saying anyone break any laws, but I'm for the taming and adoption of aquatic creatures into agriculture, into, into uh, industry. Let them get, you know, put them in, coach. Come on, yo. Yeah, it's interesting, man, because they communicate via sound vibration frequencies. They have a language. They talk to each other. Yeah. And at bare minimum, I think that we are able to communicate with them directly. You know yep. what I mean? So that's a huge. We want to talk about missing link? The missing link is fucking human dolphin communication because I think it's totally possible. Oh yeah, they love people. They yeah. love, love, love people. They'll come to humans' rescue more than any other animal. I'm sure dolphins. You know, it's probably neck and neck. Who saved more humans, dolphins or dogs? Because they're they're mirrored equivalents in different realms. Terrestrial dogs. Aquatic dolphins. They had run into. Uh, huh. There's there's coins, ancient coins with uh, Greek soldiers on dolphin back. You know, there's oh paintings of, of soldiers on dolphin <laughs> back. Have you ever? I've, I've 
much. Dude, Longo, have you ever seen the clip of Putin, Vladimir Putin? He's literally riding a dolphin. Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh my I god, haven't. I gotta send it to you because it's <laughs> it's available. Without a shirt on. Yeah. It's the best propaganda I've ever is seen. Is it real? So it's one hundred percent real. No and way. And there's like this epic music. Look at this, guys. I mean, man is made to ride dolphins. I'm convinced. And there's one where he's got a weapon. See? Yeah. See? Wow. And I think man having a lack of communication, there's tyrannical force to make that happen as opposed to, like Al Dog said, a correspondence. The communication measures just aren't there. Or else I think we'd still be doing it because that looks sick as hell. This is why people resonate with movies like uh, Avatar and Aqua World or whatever it's called, Water World, Aquaman, all this shit. Like, we lived it. We was Atlanteans, y'all. Back in them, back in them past lives, we was Atlanteans. Okay, we was riding into battle on Dolphinback, and this is exactly what God means when He says, "Subdue the animals of the sea, subdue, have dominion over the fish." Sorry, subdue the oceans as well, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, <clears throat> over the fowl of the air. Hey, pigeon, I've got a message that's gonna get across town. You got to help us out. You got to play your part. The pigeons glad, woo, glad to do it willfully. They love showing off. They love going back to their, you know, uh, they have this internal compass uh, GPS that they can return to where they were brought up. That's amazing. They love That's showing perfect. off. Cheetahs love running fast for their prince owners. They love showing off. They love they love being majestic and showing their talents. Their God-given gifts that each animal shines in a way above all others in a unique way. So, when God gives us dominion over all these things, this is friendship. This is engagement. This is incorporation into industry and everyday life. We're not following these instructions by, you know, locking them away in study centers. Oh yeah, the sea turtles. Oh, they're so endangered that you know they're they're going to be dead in a couple of decades. They're trying to sell us, but at the same time, they're locking them up. Every time they find one injured, they just lock it away in a little cage and say, you know, and release it, and never introduce it to humans. And humans should be able to have their own pets. Endangered pet, endangered animal doesn't make sense to me in a place where humans could profit from having those animals with them day to day. So, we're not following these commandments of God. Commands, not commandment, but commands. By ignoring aquatic creatures. They should be incorporated into our everyday life. We should be falconing. Humans need to have pigeons and falcons and partake, you know, of, of the air to the skies. Phone calls are cool. You know, I make... My fair share of phone calls, but I hope to get one day get into, uh, you know, birding, whatever it's called. Mike Tyson, man, yeah, eat my pigeon, yeah. yeah I yeah. would love, I would love to have, uh, you know, a bird in my yard that would take out crows and predators from my my plants, my fruits, and stuff like that, or you know, just getting yeah. rid of bugs and stuff like that, like ducks. You have ducks in your yard, they'll eat the snails from smothering your plants. They'll eat the snails yeah. all day, for example. I'd love to get into the falcons taking yeah. out whatever. The Seminole Indians tamed herons. I'm gonna look this up. Herons? Herons, yeah, egrets. They had they tamed egrets. I've tamed I've tamed sandhill cranes about a hundred times in my life, to be honest. No, but probably about fifty times in my life. Wait, wait, what, Spence? You you've trained birds? <laughs> sandhill cranes in Florida, you know the big, yeah. tall, gray ones with the red head. Okay. They they literally are in everybody's backyards where I live. You know, right now there's hundreds of them in this field right down the street from me. They will eat out of your hand. And so when I was a little kid, yeah. my granddad and grandmother they ate out of their hands. They ate right in front of them. And they were just, they've just been a part of my life for so long that you can tame them if you just like feed them and sit in the backyard calmly. You won't be a threat to them in no time in a neighborhood. Sandhill cranes. So you can tame them easy. Wow. 
Yeah, just like deer. Similar, very similar. So these are the egrets in Billy Bowleg's front yard, or raised by Billy Bowleg's. The white plumed egret in a Florida yard. Wow. These are not just wild things. These guys love humans. They want to be grown up and be fed little sardines and little bait fish and stuff. They love humans. And there, there's some more of this stuff. I'll try and find. This is a, look, Billy Bowlegs. That might be a sandhill crane, I think. Yep, exactly what what uh, Spencer was just describing. Right there. The, what yes. we're looking at. And Matt Valentine, I've had your comment up for so long, I forgot about it. Uh, I think I might go on a Python expedition a little coming up here if if it lines up in my schedule. I'd love to go Python hunting. Get those fucking things out of here. You know, it, it's not it's not like we're going on a genocide. There's like a hundred of them and they need to be gone. That's they, a that's a bad. problem that can that can be solved. So let's nip it in the butt. Let's nip it in the butt and you know, unfortunately take the lives of a couple dozen, couple hundred pythons to spare the thousands and the millions that they could that they could detriment. You know, you gotta bite the bullet sometimes. I mean, you know, no. Vegans shouldn't say that they're above killing, that they're above, you know, stomping, stomping uh, offenders out in nature, invasive species. You could also, you know, you've got this guilt tripping argument that all humans are invasive and we're invasive to every species. So how could we, uh, you know, go around being the decider? Um, God just gave us the authority to be the decider. That's why the Bible is important. Don't let these environmentalist vegans pull the wool over your eyes, okay? You know, it might come down to using animal products sometimes. It might come down to taming animals. But when it comes to invasive animals, something as threatening as the python that has literally no ancient precedent for being in Florida, get that thing out of here. Open season on pythons. Now, the iguana... The iguana really doesn't dis dis disturb as much. I think we should keep the populations down. But, um, you know, I, I killed plenty of iguanas growing up, and they always told us, hey, open season on those. Get rid of them. But I think they're pretty. I think they're majestic. I think they're a good fit to Florida. And there are lizards native to Florida. There is no giant snake native to Florida. So... We should get so, those things out of here. Is it? Kill, it's a kill them if you got them. You guys yeah. got a bunch of those things, and they're thriving, and like they're causing issues. Yeah. Oh, they're, yeah. Thr they're thriving in the Everglades, and they wow. find them in downtown Miami. They even find them as I've far been, as Orlando. They find them. Yep. You know, I've been invited on the same hunts and almost gone, and actually, I have gone just for fun on drives, and we've literally found them close to the Everglades when we were bass fishing in uh like near Okeechobee we just kind of went and they were there it was wild wow now you could take a Jainist approach to the Bible too and say well one of the commandments is to never kill never murder and in a senseless scenario with no justification that's what you'd be doing if you were in Asia and you killed a python you know, you have no good reason to do so. Murder is cold-blooded murder. God clearly supports victors and righteous defenders of, of nature and the weak by means of warfare, you know, if, if needs be. So, yeah, get the pythons out of here. That's what comes to mind. I wouldn't sweat the... Uh, Certain species like iguana, you know, if, hey, if things get tough, you can eat a ton of iguana. Better have those things around. Than, um, there's a bunch of iguana here. Those aren't really, they're established. They're here. They're here to stay. They're not going anywhere. You know, they're, they're settled in and it's really not disturbing much. They die off every winter. There's, you know, there's control systems in, in place. There's checks in place in nature. Iguanas can come up from Cuba all they want, but why are they native to Cuba? Because the cold of Florida will kill them. A winter, oh, yeah. a 30 degree, you know, a wave of 30 degree weather, which we they get fall here out and of the there. Trees. They fall they out of trees like exactly. sack of potatoes. They go, and they'll be, be laying in the yard. 
Yeah, wow. and even even a cold like that could be tough for pythons, but they don't need the sun as much as iguanas do. You know, an, anacondas. We have anacondas and pythons in the Everglades, huh. going crazy. Rattlesnakes uh, are tattletales. That's what rock and roll says. Rattlesnakes are tattletales. So I hope that answers that, Matt. But what we're looking at here is Billy Bowlegs, a Seminole Indian, who has tamed these sandhill cranes, like Spencer was saying. These are the tall cranes that sometimes get as tall as six feet. Big, big, tall. They almost have more like a turkey-like body or a big, like, goose-like body than an egret. They're a little bit more, like, sturdy, almost like an emu. They're uh, almost closer to an emu, but still a wading bird. They're just not as, they don't fly as often, and they don't, um, they don't spear with their head in, in quite the same way. They're a little bit more like they peck. Um, they literally yeah. sound like velociraptors, too, if the people don't know that aren't from Florida. They sound yeah. like straight-up Jurassic Park velociraptors, and it will echo for miles. Wow. Yeah. And this is a sandhill crane. So this is a crane. That's a Billy Bowlegs. He was like six foot two or something. Tall guy, seminal, sturdy gentleman. He loved egrets. Raising egrets. Little baby egrets. You can read this book. It's uh, free, available online. Seminoles of Florida by Minnie Moore Wilson. I want to get to the bottom here. There's a picture of Billy Bowlegs. That's him when he was younger. Billy There's the egrets that he's raising. Those are egrets. Before were cranes. These are egrets. Then look at that. That's what I was looking for. The great look heron. Look how sick that is. Those are wow. herons. Those aren't egrets. Those are herons. Yeah, good. Thank you, Spencer. So he has he's he's taming egrets, herons, and cranes. Those are all over Bach Tower too. Yeah, Bach, and they Edward they raise. Bach. Yeah. Every neighborhood should be like this. You know, isn't that the best way to have them thrive in nature? Is to be then into to the neighborhood. You know. They'll get more. They'll just a thought, just an idea. Maybe the whole red tape and you know, uh, sending everyone to prison who like has a pet they're not supposed to isn't the best thing to do. You should encourage people to have unusual pets, it you know, better them alive in captivity than dead elsewhere. You know, I just want to throw out this looking at a lot of the Renaissance photos and or sorry paintings a lot of the renaissance paintings mind and bill called them photos sometimes you will see peacocks everywhere when i was a kid we used to see peacocks everywhere in central florida brandon florida in neighborhoods just out everywhere peacocks if you don't know what they sound like it's a, it's a really cool you know call but they are yeah. just gorgeous or old world creatures they used to be littered in Florida until all the overdevelopment. But man, yeah. I would literally go eat at this place called Lone Star, whatever steakhouse when I was a kid with my grandfather. And I remember feeding the, the peacocks. They were everywhere in the parking lot and it was just known. And you could literally put a quarter in a gumball machine and get feed and hand feed the peacocks. And it was just awesome. Amen. Majestic animal. Beautiful. Dude, Florida is like the Garden of Eden. You, nowhere else can man dwell closer to the animals and peace and harmony. You can feed the birds right out of your hand. Even I used to drive down to the Keys Courthouse because I got arrested for selling pot, but it doesn't matter. I used to have to drive down to the Keys, you know, like once a month or something when that was going on. When I was like 19, I went to the, I went to college in the Keys too. I, you know, should have started there. I went to college in the Keys. Wow. Key West. Uh, got in a little trouble slinging God's good green herb medicine, you know, but hey, I learned my lesson, paid my, paid my dues. And I used to go to Key West all the time and key deer. Who's ever heard of a key deer? You ever oh, there's, of? yeah. There's key so deer. Tiny. Held on. No, nah, man, I don't know what that is. I got to Google it. Key deer. So cool. I'm going to look it up. Okay. They got little they're, horns. They're like pocket deer. Interesting. They they're smaller are than regular. Tiny little deer who love getting fed. They oh, go out yeah. on the beach. They come up out of the mangroves 
and wow. they love people and they love getting fed snacks and they just are so happy next to humans. They're not really scared off easy. Even the men, the, you know, the males get uh, horns like that. Look at that little <laughs> slice of cheese right there. <laughs> Key deer, they're so cute. They're tiny. They live in the mangroves. They love mangroves. So this courthouse yeah. used to be next to the mangroves. And I used to go there and sit before the courthouse would open. It would be a long drive. And there'd be key deer just like oozing out of the swamp, just going right up to people in between the parking lot, just like chilling. Not, you know, when I drive up through like North Florida, the deer see a car coming and it's like, holy hell, you know, it's, it's like a, it's like a minefield you're going through. They don't know what's going on. They haven't gotten the picture yet. The cars are like zooming by 70 miles an hour. They go right up next to it. They go right in front of the car. They get caught up in the lights, whatever. The key deer don't really have this problem. Now they get, they get smacked and there's only one way in and one way out. And they've got these 35 mile per hour zones for the key deer's sake and there's not very many and there weren't very many to begin with these tiny little key deer are you know example exhibit a of almost every species wants to engage with humans on some level even the most timid ones they do not view us as predators they simply do not so how's that for canines you know they don't view us as predators it lets you get right up next to them and feed them. And they're that tiny. You could subdue that thing with your bare hands. Like, no no problem. It knows that. You know that. But it's still comfortable with a stranger going up and getting fed. I used to feed squirrels like crazy. You know, I love feeding squirrels. They know you. They remember you for years. It's. I go to the same beach sometimes. You know, I'm sure... There's been months where I forgot to give them a walnut. They still look at me and like they remember me. It's crazy. <laughs> huh. So, yeah. And when I say tamed, like, you know, 50 sandhill crane, it's like if you're on a job site for a week or something and there's cranes in the backyard, if you start feeding them the first day, by the last day, they're eating out of your hand. If you've got an egret behind you and you've got bait in your bait bucket and you're fishing, <laughs> literally by the end of the day fishing, you could be feeding the egret by hand you know that that's just that's just how i think we're disconnected from our correspondence we could have with nature just completely because we're too busy trying to keep up with the high capacitance of you know man's you know modern technological society if you will and whatever it may mm -hmm. be but i just there's a corresponding flow that is just seems to be off it's either elon musk or hippy dippy there's no like where's the middle where's my balance man where's my badass like minimalist um, you know, techno house in, a, in some beautiful land and climate with with yep. less resistance, less yeah. friction, but still we have power and the things around have power, but it's not just total chaos and disorder. There's there's structure. We're not following the structure of law and creation and, and divinity, I don't think. And you can kind of feel it. You can smell it. You can taste it a lot of times. Food, air, water, everything. Shall I Oh, yeah. Let's get back to the book here, guys. Let's not forget reading the Bible. Oh, yeah. My bad. No, you're all good. Uh, dominion over the fish and the birds. Go. Over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Even the bugs. Even the microbes. Keep them at it. We're most important, dare I say. We're made in the image of God, so of course he'd put us at the forefront. We're at the top of the pyramid. Not the food pyramid, the pyramid. So, verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which upon which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and in which is the fruit of a tree, yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Clearly, vegetarian, fruitarian, we already proved that. Not going to dwell on it too much. 
And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day, and from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For Lord, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed life into his nostrils, the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So we've got to stop there. The breath of life. Mm. Breath of life is a separate endowment from the rest of nature. The breath of life. You could interpret that as speech. You could interpret that as song. You could interpret that as chanting, anything. But it's set apart from the rest of nature. It's set apart from the birds who sing. It's set apart from the, you know, monkeys who, who uh, you know, chirp and the parrots who talk. They can talk. All animals breathe. So what are we endowed with? The breath of life. That's pretty transcendental there. That's, but moving forward, well, here, what do you guys think about the breath of life? What does breath of life mean? And well, and do you think the other animals got the breath of life? Well, to me, I think it means spirit, you know, specifically human spirit. Right. It actually really reminds me of something in the Hawaiian culture where they call the Taurus, the native Hawaiians call the Taurus howlies. And that word translates to without breath, without spirit. So, you know, when you talk about the breath of life, to me, it's like the, the spark of divinity, the, the Holy Spirit, if you will. That's how I interpret it. Yep. Prana, ki, chi, vril. These are good. Yep. Good suggestions, guys. Spencer, what is the breath of life? Mm. Um. I'm not going to I'm not going to disagree with anything I've just heard. I think it's I think it's going to have to be pretty broad, but I do see now how it could be definitely more directed for just us and not necessarily the beasts if you will of the earth, yep. the animals. Um yep. but I did what I did catch, you know, I did I, I I'm going to slow down on breath of life before I talk too long, but dust, did you say dust? Was it the dust that we were created from before right, the yeah. breath of life? Here, I'll, I'll rewind a little. Um, yeah, chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, real quick How here, Spence. Yeah. How did you have nostrils? All right, so hold on. He created you. Okay, never mind. Go ahead. Well, I was just, it popped into my head. Uh, clearly, man is a nasal breath. Nasal breath. Yeah, boom. Great point. Oh, my God. No Great mouth point. breathing in the kingdom uh, of heaven. No mouth breathing in true nature. You yeah. breathe through that nose, Mr. and Mrs., whoever's out there. Breathe through your nose. If you always say my nose is too stuffy, then you gotta quit taking the fucking mu mucinex and uh, fucking all this uh, Dayquil and shit, and just blow your goddamn nose. Get it out. Go run. No, it's the Go food. run. Go it's hike. The food, Longo. It's yeah, the food. Well, quick. Okay, quick. Anything. Just clean it up and don't settle for a stuffy nose. Do not settle for a stuffy nose. And if you're snoring, that is God's way of telling you, shut the hell up and fix what's going on. Yeah. I agree. Don't don't let anyone you love snore next to you. Don't let them do it. And why would you let them do that to you? 
and disturb your sleep. It's, it is offensive to the ears. Snoring is not to be tolerated. Do not tolerate snoring. It is a symptom of mouth breathing, incorrect jaw posture, tongue posture. It leads to a drooping face. It leads to weight gain. It leads to a dry mouth, bad teeth, bad posture, early mental decline. Take that to the bank, 100%. Yeah. So mouth breathing is not to be tolerated. If you have a partner who snores, don't let them. Wake them up. Tell them to shift position. You know, tell them to try the mouth tape. It's not that bad. Mouth tape. I know people who do it. I know people who have results from it. You know, I luckily I've never snored. Here and there, you know, you have an extra, extra sleepy night, and you you know fall asleep on the couch with your head in the wrong. You know, you snore when you're in the wrong position. So if you're snoring every night, what is that saying? Snoring is not natural it is the alarm is going off wake up notice the people Pastor around you are dairy. supposed to supposed to answer the alarm so snoring is evil it is the demon devil himself brought into the home screaming and the alarm is going off this is not good this man is this person that you love is swallowing air whole inhaling any dust bug demon that wants to fall into their mouth yeah your mouth is your immune system if, you know forget what how clean you're eating keep your mouth shut you can eat as many mangoes as you want to and you know detox as much as you want if you're sucking down dirty air and inhaling exhaust and you know airborne microbes and airborne demons demons fly into your mouth by the way keep your mouth closed Jeez. Bad breath, too. Bad breath only comes from a dry mouth. Literally can't come from anywhere else. Decaying teeth only comes from a dehydrated mouth. Only. Saliva keeps your teeth clean and whole. The drier the mouth, the worse the teeth. That's almost a rule of thumb. So all these things are laid out in the Bible. But, um... It just reminds me we are the salts of the earth, man, right? Before the breath of life, he created us from the dust, the salts of the earth, man. The, tw the 12 cell salts you brought up many times. I, I, I love the fact that that's what we are outside of the water and the light and the breath of life. I, th I would think the breath of life would be the water and the light, honestly, man. I, but, I think it's when people say prana, that's you know probably the best way to sum it up real it's it's in the breath but it's tinged with life it's this extra life-giving property it's breath put to purpose it's breath endowed with a deeper design you know all the, the true yogis aerobic you know body interested spiritual leaders always say breath is life Eric breath Bay. is breath is everything breath is the churning of the energy if you're, if you're locked in prison, you still have a, uh, you know, as much freedom as, as anyone because you can breathe. You, know, you can focus on your breath. Breath yeah. is everything. Just for, just for the people in the chat, you know, just throwing this out there for you. Fungus, mold, candida, guys, and mucus. If you're eating pasteurized dairy late at night that is going to instantaneously cause mucus, that's going to alter your breathing patterns for that night. So if it's inflammatory, again, fungus, mold, candida, if it's environmental, pay attention to those things. If you can't, if you know you're a mouth breather and you can't tonight put a piece of tape over your mouth and survive, that should be an indicator that you have a problem, that you're either broken, you know, septum from getting the shit kicked out of you, like me growing up, like, you know, you got something going on, but usually it's dried up mucus and it's inflammatory feuds and, and just reactions and so it's diet related guys once you change diet it, it's so different like it, it's crazy yeah and if you want to clean out your sinuses and uh clean out your whole system and really fortify your nutrition you can get some moringa guys shameless plug <laughs> get some moringa you can support the channel spend money it goes to me so you know 
It's an excuse to support me at the very least. At the very most, you're going to get like the best superfood there is. Moringa, just shredded leaf. That's it. And <clears throat> codes below. Make sure to use code Old World Florida. I can't yeah, believe it. Can't believe the days come when I'm saying that. But uh, use code Old World Florida, all caps, to get me paid. Yo, gets. Let's get that money. Let's get that part popping up here. Okay. Let's get the bills raining. And uh, it's a moringa, miracle leaf, tree of life. It is. Does wonders. This is what we're doing now, Al Dog and Spence. I got my new. Got my new uh, sponsor, first sponsor, official sponsor of the uh, yeah, <laughs> overall Florida YouTube channel, my buddy Alex. Yeah, I saw it. Um, I love it. When he went on and explained his whole thing, it seems really cool. Yeah. So he's got a little code, you know, it's helping me out. It really is helping me out. And I'll take, you know, the support from a product that I actually would take myself. <laughs> I got 50, I got 50 Moringa trees for the channel growing as well. So don't think you guys can out buy us. And right. do, they ship, do they ship all over the continental U S or is it just Florida? Yes. It ships everywhere. Ships all over to the U S under a P go get them. Alex is a great dude. He's sweet as can be, you know, he says as sound as they get, for a business owner, awesome. I met him. Met him at this beautiful, you know, uh, bridge by the ocean. Very nonchalant, very chill. No boring, you know, business like minutia. He was just like, "Yeah, here's the shit. Here's your code, and boom, done, easy, okay." And they're so vegan. Shouldn't... And they're vegan. I love to take moringa, but um. Yeah, I used to mix it into my water. You can take a pill if you don't like the taste. You can open these pills up, throw them in your water. It's Moringa. It's simple. It's easy. This is his, you know, his company, not mine. But he's uh, very nice enough to make this happen. And he's pro propelling the channel forward. So if you want to clean up your diet, you can get that. Okay. Commercial's over. Done. Thank you, Jillian, for posting that. So, let's see what we've got here. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon... Oh, sorry. Uh, I went too far about. Thus the heavens... Shit, where were we? Oh, uh, we oh are... yeah. Right. We're at Eden, Garden of Eden, okay. Chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse... Seven. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now, what does dust mean? I think the point of using dust is kind of similar to saying mud. You know, some renditions of this say man is crafted out of mud. Um, it's, it's stressing the insignificance of matter. That man was made from this, you know, very insignificant, secondary, dense creation, but then endowed with the breath of life. So it's a big boost, big leap out of material. It's saying, hey, you know, yeah, you just got a material body you have to care for the same way every animal does. But at the same time, by giving, by being given the breath of life, you've leaped bounds above the animal kingdom. So it's it's just stressing the, I don't know about if it's duality or contrast there. I'm going from dust, just mud, you have a body that's matter, and the matter's almost worthless at the end of the day. You know, will we'll succumb to time. What you're being endowed with, the breath of life, is timeless. All we are is dust in the wind. What is dust, by the way? Dust is literally, like in your house, what is it? You know, what do we Good what do we look at? Dead Good skin point. cells. Good point. And look at uh rock and roll is pointing out words that rhyme or have to do with um dust, rust. lust, bust, rust, decay, degradation, it seems to be. Um crust. <laughs> 
Yeah. I, I interpret dust as the lowest form of matter. Like it's right. like, it's almost, it kind of reminds me of not quite smoke because smoke is different because smoke can go from solid to air. Right. But with dust, it's like so fine. It can kind of, it can't quite go to smoke, but it's, it's almost close because it's just so, so minimal. You know what yeah. I mean? Good point. Uh, what's up, Rebecca? Rebecca Frost, I see you in there. Some uh, homies from New Orleans, Louisiana, I should say. But um, let's keep it moving. Let's keep it grooving. Here is my favorite part of Genesis, I got to say. Chapter 2, verse 9. And God, sorry. Sorry, 8. Verse 8, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Well, he put man in the form. Sorry, he put man in the garden. And another thing that man was endowed with, form. Form. That's a big concept. Big, big concept getting introduced. Form. So he planted a garden eastward in Eden. Now get your Florida goggles on here because we got to talk about it. No one ever knows, has admitted to know, claims to officially know where the Garden of Eden was. There's a guess that it's by the Euphrates and Tigris today in Iraq. But guess what? Noah clearly did not take off from the same continent where he landed a little bit further down in the story. The Garden of Eden was in a different continent than the one that Noah landed in. How do we know this? He spent at least 150 days on the seas in a boat in the oceans and appeared. He landed in Eurasia. Yes, he landed uh, you know, near Turkey or Armenia, mountains of Ararat. It's never said where he departed from. Yeah, drop some, uh, drop some uh, fucking oranges in the chat if you think the Garden of Eden was in America, baby. Let's get the fireworks going, okay? We all know where it actually was and why they're having us spill endless blood over a big old sandbox in the Middle East. It's not worth anything. They are deprived of bare necessities for life in order to render these places fertile you'd have to um what's the word you'd have to uh irrigate, irrigate the rivers the massive rivers that run through there you have to irrigate them for miles to render this desert useful and they've done that and as soon as humans stop taking care of it it falls back to desert you could say there's a nuclear war you could say this or that um, Joseph, I see your comment. Noah wasn't in Eden. That's true. But he's in the same continent as Eden. We can infer that, considering Adam and Eve left on foot and their generations had gone very far. And the neighborhoods they were staying in were still the neighborhoods that Adam and Eve passed on their way out. Um, yes, Ben. Don't some believe Eden would have been near the North Pole? North America um, could. Yeah. yeah, sure. That's really the only alternative that I see. There's three. There's three possibilities here. The uh, tracing down the the uh, links between North Florida, the Georgia border, mm -hmm. and Eden is my number one hobby. And there's a lot of there's a lot of truth to that. And I don't think you can really go wrong with you know, leaning in that direction. I definitely don't think it was Iraq. Nope. I definitely don't think it was close to Turkey or Armenia where Noah landed. Um, the North Pole is really the only other alternative I see. Unless the third option would be that there's a system, there's a franchising of Eden in different continents along the 31st degree parallel north. You have the four, uh, ri four rivers of Appalachia 
Apalachicola, coming down from Atlanta, down to the Gulf of Mexico. And you'll see the world's only four-headed river system, truly four-headed river system. Um, Hyperborea. Now, the North Pole is a compelling candidate. It is. I'm a proponent of the Bach saga. I think you can't go wrong with the Bach saga. But I like to reconcile E.E. E. Calloway's theories with the Bach saga and Arctic origins. You know, some races, some, at least one race, had their origin in the North Pole. But I can promise you that at... Uh, hello, we're close, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, the door was open. No, we're in the middle of something. I'm sorry, sir. Thank you. I'll come back. Thank you. Oh, there's a there's a there's an amazing story that uh oh i gotta be careful saying this name on this show john levi read a story something escaped the smoky god or something and he it just read it and it was awesome it was about the north pole and it was pretty interesting it sounded like the garden of eden was being described in this old old book that i, I would love to get my hands on smoky god something yeah I, I'm not familiar with the North Pole theory. Um, I'm not sure what evidence there is. Like, yeah. Have you ever heard of Hyperborea, Al? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I'm loosely familiar with this, the Hyperborea. So, so I know the comes, generalities of it, yeah, not the specifics. So, you know what I mean? It, well, what could be specific? When this it comes is, to these flat earth cosmology maps and things like that, that's mm -hmm. where Hyperborea generally started hitting yeah. the scene again. Yeah. And then even and someone made fun of me for saying it and even mentioning it and i was like well here's henry kissinger's book that he published that has hyperborea right at the top right there on the so, you know, on the cartography of the front of his book so i'm like it's not like we're just making shit up and it was at the north pole so it's it's a great question to raise spencer and it's not one that i shy away from there is a reconciliation between the arctic garden of eden and the floridian garden of eden but there are some ways that I, you know, kind of point more to Florida. But in the Bach saga, one of the central elements is the Gulf Stream, which goes from Finland to Florida. And if Eden was a franchise, they would have established it in Florida first because the Gulf Stream would have taken them straight to there if they were leaving from any other place like the North Pole. You could come down the coast of Africa and make it to Florida. You could, you know, there's different ways you could make it back to Florida from different uh, continents. Now, the four rivers being in the North Pole is kind of the main evidence being given for the Eden theory in the North Pole. But the four rivers here are arranged like quad, like uh, quarters, like quadrants. Right, right. Of, of the uh, Earth. And, you know, the Greeks sometimes show similar, the Greeks show a similar cosmology. Uh, Arctic, you have your mountain, or sorry, Vedic, you have your Mount Maru at the center. Black this Rock. Mountain at the center, the four rivers. Again, I think this is the opposite. We're seeing the literalization, over-literalization of the Bible story. Okay. And now I am an Arctic origins guy for at least one race of humans. But I'm also a Floridian origins guy for at least one race of humans. And those can happen side by side. Um, I would point out that in the Bible it says eastward in Eden. What exactly is eastward about the North Pole? Not much. Whereas Florida and the southeast United States are clearly the eastward extension of an already existing land. Relative to the larger landmass, Florida is eastward. Relative to all of America, uh, the Florida-Georgia border is eastward. There's nothing necessarily eastward about these four rivers. And what it says about the rivers, it says that they all watered the garden. And it's not explicitly said, but it's implied that they may be flowing in the same direction. They're flowing to different cities and regions we're going to see here. But uh, 
you know, this is your Arctic four rivers where they're each quartering the earth. In the Floridian origins, you're going to see a hand. You're going to see a, a hand print. Four rivers traveling the same direction. And when you go to Christian uh, depictions of... Is, there, is the tree of life in the Garden of Eden? Yes. Okay, so... Isn't that one of the biggest other clues? Mount Maru is chopped down, is the chopped down version of Tree of Life, and the trees were chopped down so they couldn't be climbed type of story. Have you ever gotten into that with the well, Nephilim? Right now, we're only as far as Genesis, and we oh, shouldn't correct. complicate it any more than it needs to be. But right. when you see the rivers of Eden being depicted like this, long before Florida was ever discovered, you could see an eastward um landmass of grouping of four rivers like a hand now when they try and identify these here this is a i like to use this one a lot four rivers of eden extending out of one one river split into four now when we go back to that arctic model how exactly is it that four rivers are coming out of one that just it, looks like four rivers. Yep. When, whereas the other arrangement has, uh, here, boom. <laughs> look who's that. Oh, look who that is. I wonder what handsome gentleman made that video and <laughs> got it onto Google search results, maybe. That's a Old World Florida video right there. Garden of Eden. No, those are not two dudes. <laughs> that's Adam and Eve. It's just his name's covering her tits. So that's, that's a guy and a girl. They're no more androgynous than any of the um, models were back then for you know getting painted for great works of art. But this is your Garden of Eden in Florida. On the Florida-Georgia border, Nice, which you can see right here, Florida-Georgia border, uh, I wish I knew a Florida Georgia line song that I could sing every time I say that. Oh, God. But Florida Georgia line, the Zionist music executives are trying to rub it in your face, okay? The Florida Georgia line is the most talentless uh, country rap garbage group there is. And I think they're a bit of a Zionist ploy to disrupt the Florida Georgia, the integrity of the Florida Georgia border, and to kind of make a mockery of it. Like when they make movies titled uh, Jupiter Ascending, but there's no real astrology in it. It's just sci-fi garbage to kind of water down the the word and topic itself. Yeah. These are the poor rivers of Eden, allegedly, in Florida. Now, what does the name Florida mean? Flora, flowers, flowery, blossoming, blooming, gardens. You have flowers and gardens, do you not? Gardens are down on the floor. Gardens, you choose the wettest and flattest piece of land you have. Well, that's Florida. Uh, you choose the most well-irrigated piece of land you have. Well, that's Florida. Highest concentration of freshwater springs in the world. In the Apalachicola area, where this exact four-headed river system is, is a ice age um, refuge, meaning the things there survive the ice age. And there's a whole slew of species that are not found anywhere else. It's one of Earth's biodiversity hotspots. It has every fitting characteristic of the Garden of Eden. In Iraq, they have none of these. You have to travel a mile with a bucket to find water. Miles. Uh, they've been warring forever. Um, there is no green, thriving nature, kingdom of nature. Do they really expect us to believe that man came from a lush garden in Iraq in a, you know, 6,000 years ago? I don't believe that. I think there's a lot more to the story, and it brings, and, it, and the story includes both continents. How naive to think that just because Noah landed in Eurasia, that everything prior to then in the Bible had occurred in Eurasia. This is the Fundamental flaw in all Christian archaeology and, uh, you know, I hate saying Judeo-Christian, but Judeo-Christian uh, his history, 
archaeology, anthropology, they always forget that Noah landed in Eurasia but didn't take off from there. Okay. So I am not unfounded for, for supposing offering Florida as an alternative. It has all the characteristics. It has all the requirements that Eden would have needed. And look at the word, flora, the Greco-Roman goddess of spring and flowers and vegetation. The springs, the waters here, life-giving, considered to be the fountain of youth, the state itself, the springs themselves, the sunlight, everything. All these things were preserving to life. Florida crosses many boxes off when it comes to looking for Eden. Now, we're going to get a little deeper in the story here. But uh, God, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also, Spencer, in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, I love, love North Carolina. I love Colorado here and there. But do I describe those places, and, and they are, you know, ripe with na natural beauty. But do I, would I describe those places as abounding in every tree pleasant to the sight? Like they kind of got like four types of trees that repeat for miles and miles and miles. Whereas Florida, in one neighborhood block, you can truly make an argument that you have seen every tree pleasant to the sight. In a single walk through a neighborhood, you can see all the major exalted trees of world mythology, world religions. The Kapok of the Aztec and the Maya, the Oak of the Druids, the Cypress of the the Cypress of the uh, you know Mexicans, Montezuma's Cypress, also Aztec and Maya and Native American. You know they have Cypress all over. The Cypress, the Kapok tree, the Baobab tree, the Olive tree, the Oak, the Ash, the all of the sacred tree mythologies are present in Florida. Not all native, but are all present. So, they all find a happy home here and thrive. Kapok trees grow on fast forward in Florida. It's, it's remarkable. It so, seems that the vagabonds knew that as well. Yeah. You mean like the, uh, the, the, the uh, Tartarian road trip? Yeah, that yeah. vagabonds, the four uh, horsemen of the yeah. industrial apocalypse. They seem yeah. to have a uh, specific liking to the trees in Florida. They left them behind. They imported them. They found them. They stayed near the oldest and the biggest and the most exotic, etc. Yep. So we've got the Garden of Eden. Man has been put into the Garden of Eden. Every tree pleasant to the sight. Then he made the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, this is where the interpretation really, you know, starts thickening. You can pull out many different interpretations. I've heard it said that the tree of knowledge is the positive polarity in the body. Sorry, the tree of life is the positive and the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the negative polarity in the body. Going up the spinal column two channels of energy going up the spinal column and that the serpent going up one of these trees is indicative of the prana and the vril and the kundalini and we're not trying to dilute christianity here with you know imagery from other religions but you have to put put your mind to what is the tree of life and what is the tree of knowledge of good and evil now the tree of knowledge of good and evil is going to uh betray some of its more um you know, telling characteristics to us, we're going to see. You'll be able to narrow the tree of knowledge of good and evil down a little bit more. Tree of life is a little bit harder to conceptualize just off of what we're given in Genesis. But what is the tree of life? Some would say it's the oak. 
Some would say it's the baobab. Some would say it's the moringa. If you're if you're looking for an actual literal tree, almost all of them are present in Florida. Happy to grow in Florida. Well, if it's a concept, the tree of life is everywhere. It's it's the Taurus field. It's the atom. It is the everything churning in. You know this toroidal field. The tree is the toroidal field. If we look at um, here. You know, you know, it's almost where the floating island of Florida meets the bedrock as well. I never thought of that, and where that meeting pl takes place. Yeah, is a very powerful location. This is the tree of life, ultimately, the universal tree of life. It's ever present. It's not in one state. It's in every state. It's in every corner of the world. The tree of life is the representation, the the single you know, visualization of the toroidal field, the branches of the tree and the roots, each doing their task, each drawing energy in, pulling it out of the sky, drawing in the ether, carving reality. This is the tree of life that's ever present, not just in Florida, but it's here too. Yeah. It's What's everywhere. interesting here in this uh, depiction, the tree of life has an aura to it. Yeah. Right, so it's sort of like your toroidal field is like your aura, or the energy yes. you give off. Exactly, your bio field. Your, your aura yeah. is is your exactly toroidal field, your bio field. And some people are larger, some are skinny. If you're fat, it's barely even poking through your skin. <laughs> you you've swallowed your aura. Fat people have no aura. <laughs> They've swallowed their aura. It's true. That's why they are. I hate to say it. Do better, guys. We can all do better. Up on the treadmill. Yeah. Um, well, it's almost like there are we'll negative presence because their positive aura doesn't exceed their physical presence. So it's like, yes, wow. No, if you're fat, they, they've insulated. Aura. They've insulated themselves like plastic or petroleum, yes. uh, plastic around an electrical yeah. wire, copper wire. They are not rating. They are not able to receive and broadcast signals the same. They're not the yes. same radio transmitter walking around. This is a corresponding flow you're looking at, but when People have plastic clothes on, for example, this ruins an aura. It's like having trash bags on. It's like having, you know, around this wire has petroleum. That's your insulator. Things that cause harmonic interference and electrical impedance interrupt this flow that you're looking at. And a lot of people look at the human body as a double toroid as well. But yeah, your biofield is literally, I kid you not, literally what they want to tap into right now for wireless devices. They want to measure your biology and utilize your biofield to power devices that they want to have attached to you. 6G is going to involve your own biofield and wireless power induction. Mark my cool. words. Luckily, the Bible doesn't deal with any of that, you know, garbage that's coming out recently. The Bible gives no gives no validity to any of that garbage that's coming out. So luckily we can just pretty much flush all this fear, porn, tech, you know, harvesting the human body. Uh, They're using it. The, it's simple. It's no, not, no, 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 no. We're using nature. We're using nature. We're using the air. They can, spray, they can spray the air all they want, but it's still giving me everything I need, you know. That, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. They're just... They're going to utilize your biofield for their little tech. No, 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 no one's going to use. Sensor. Yeah, no one's going to use my biofield. Okay, yeah, that, that, that thought's not in my head. That's okay. That sounds like a paranoid delusion. I'm protected by Jesus Christ. No one's getting in my biofield. Let it be known. Okay. Demons will have their heads hacked off should they approach me. Okay, but either by me or by okay. my guardian angels. This is how you. I mean, it's got to be said. This is how do you defend I, yourself. Do I have wireless power induction? Do I have earbuds in my ears? No. Do I have something around my wrist? No. Did I inject myself with something? No. I chose not to do those things because it's more intelligent than covering yourself with all of this nonsense that could be absolutely heavy metals. You're not If you're just sitting there consuming heavy metals all day, you're acting like it doesn't matter. Okay, you're telling well, me it doesn't matter to stay clean and be, understand these things? No, but I think you're adding to what I said. Always stay clean. I'm the number one proponent of holistic, clean living. But at the end of the day, Bill Gates is breathing the same goddamn 5G spray that we are. He's drinking the same water we are for the most part. You know, Rockefeller had his 
Florida spring water shipped to him wherever he was. But we're all sharing in the same suffering, even with the Rothschild elites. They can spray the air. They can do as much 5G as they want. They're still suffering as much as us. So it's not changing anything in the world scale. It's just a fear tactic. Anything that they develop, the body rises above. They put out Wi-Fi. Okay, the body gets it used to that. The immune we system ad adapts for Wi-Fi. Yeah. They can try all they want to. They have no dominion over our manual. You know, God wrote our manual. They can't infect that. As many, they can put out as many GMO mosquitoes as they want to. Let them come. You know what I always say? All the goy slop in the world <laughs> doesn't make a fucking dent. Not a dent. They're just slinging shit at a wall. So as much as, yeah, you should eat clean, but they're eating the goy slop too. It's all, all the chemicals are in their water too. You know what's going to separate you from Bill Gates? This needs to be said and take this to heart. Christ, Jesus, you can welcome Jesus Christ into your heart. Bill Gates is barred from entry. He is barred from consideration yep. due to his crimes against nature and humanity. You can invite Jesus Christ into your heart and be fortified from the 5G dust, from the fucking chemtrails, more than anyone else ever could. Yes, granted, you're taking care of yourself too, but they're drinking the same goddamn poisoned water. They're mm -hmm. getting their biofield hacked just as much. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Yes. No one's getting in my biofield. That is the ego that comes along with being a Christian. Yes, I'm above that. Yes, that's not going to touch me. You know, if you have a big ego, like like me, like our dog, maybe, <laughs> you know, if you have a big ego, that's why Jesus is the remedy. You can still have a big ego because you're team greatness, but you've given the personal element of that ego away to Jesus Christ. And you're still team winning. <laughs> you're still team champion. You're still on the team, the greatest team on earth. But now you're part of a team. You know, it's not one man show. You're still team ego. But that team is sailing to victory with Jesus Christ as the captain, coach, and quarterback. Absolutely. And I'd say this, my personal aura will fucking eviscerate <laughs> anything Bill Gates is plotting that fucking nerd. I will slap him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I like if I have this mentality that I'm made in God's image and Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm unstoppable because I've transcended in a sense. I don't care what they're up to. What I'm doing yep. is way cooler. Hanging yep. out with you guys is way cooler. So yep. fuck them. You know? Longo, would you say it's eternal? What? W once you... Would you say that's when you when you accept that's when you become eternal because you're not going anywhere and you can't be penetrated and it's like you're a yes. you're a concentrated cor corresponding flow directly yeah. connected. Jesus the is the, yes, great point. Jesus is the Son of God and the Sun in the sky. When you say you're Team Jesus, you're saying I am like the Sun. I am striving to be like the Sun, consistent, disciplined steady life giving life preserving but ultimately you eviscerate darkness you repel darkness you repel all these things you're just you're putting that uniform on you're putting that badge on and saying i'm team light so it is eternal and it is an eternal protection it's not this you know uh, confess you have to confess every sunday to earn this no yeah you can, it's to me it's you can take this skin suit out all you want but th this this connection and corresponding flow this light ain't going anywhere so it's like it, the light it, is eternal yeah yeah that, yes it's fucking it's, awesome it's, guys it's been like three hours that's such a powerful ending uh my aura has increased power levels like fucking, <laughs> like goku from dragon ball z he's a 20 footer <laughs> yes all right guys well it's been awesome Stoked to hang out with you guys again. I'll talk to you soon. All right. All right Sweet. Thanks, Thanks Aldo. Aldo. Hey, we'll shut. Up. Yeah, we'll shut it down here. Okay. All right, guys. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. See you, chat. Bye. Peace. Bye, Peace, Aldo. Aldo. Bye, Aldo. Peace, chat. Spence. Thanks for joining, man. Thanks man, for thanks fun. for fielding. You know, thanks for uh, pitching the fastballs that need to be need to be. Uh, can't all be softballs on the channel. You know. <laughs>
there needs to be a critique to some of the stuff and you you know i definitely don't take it personally at all when you're just you know it's asking all- or clarifying or you know pushing back on one thing it's all good it's all needed all right. I, I come from a, a lack of, you know, understanding, especially when it comes to just, you know, Western eyes, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, a, an extreme lack. So just remember when I'm asking questions, usually they're <laughs> genuine of me like being like, OK, so what does this mean? Because I never respected um, people enough to care about their opinion in response to genuine questions. And they were usually very disingenuous when they would respond to difficult questions. Uh, growing up in, you know, just kind of traditional, you know, church settings and things like that. So I just avoided them. And I always had the choice from my parents. So I just kind of strayed away. And I was just, I always said nature was my church. I always listened to that most high quality country music with gospel on Sundays, being funny with my friends. I was like, nope, we don't listen to rap music on Sundays. And, you know, that was just kind of my natural way. My natural church was to do something in nature on Sundays with with a, a good a good gospel going yeah 90 90s country is where i found it yeah singing music christianity has a lot of that believe it or not um you got a good community lots of singing to be had merriment but we're gonna sign off here spencer from florida on tiktok youtube instagram well tiktok and instagram mostly yeah. He's he's here on YouTube. He's probably on elsewhere done some other chats with some people on YouTube. But uh go check him out. Go check out Al Dog, buy his book, The Charter, uh, available on Amazon and at the Dancing Elephant. Uh get some moringa, guys. This is what it looks like. Just packages. All right. I open this up, you'll see what it's like. And you cut that open. My frail vegan fingers can't can't. <laughs> Spencer from Florida has moringa trees in the yard. We cut them back, and they just—it's yep. it, amazing. I put it in every meal, guys. I literally put moringa in every meal. Yep, and Spencer's got stuff like this in the works too. Products in the works. Code's going to be coming our way, and lots of uh, cooperation. We're going to be eating real food and healthy stuff, and we're going to be yeah. like fruit fruit peddlers. I like it. Starts with the moringa, right now. Gonna have, but I'm not, we're going to be doing other things. I'm going to be. We're going to be. I've got a friend who's offering shilajit and the what's it called blue something. I forget the name, but it's this other you know tree of life type superfood thing, blue supplement that takes water blue. It's not spirulina, it's something else, but that's going to be next week. We're going to have my buddy uh, Mike come on and talk about some other stuff. We're going to be slang and health stuff. You know, this is not like your, this is not your, uh, you know, pyramid scheme, like health product. It's literally just a leaf shredded up into a vegan capsule. And you can get this in any neighborhood in Florida find a moringa tree you can just make it yourself but but from here support the channel appreciate guys. you guys if you could put the jillian jillian if you could please thank you you already did thank you so much what a great moderator thank you thank you all my moderators i don't say that enough thank you guys for holding down the the trenches keeping it classy i'd rather have I'd rather have more Ringa than less Ringa. <laughs> more Ringa. Yeah. My Moors out there. Are you really a Moor if you're not buying Moringa from Dr. Longa? I mean, get Moringa, guys. Boom. That's what the capsules look like. Literally just shredded leaf. It's not some mystery dust from fucking Pakistan. I it's have some. Um, yeah. I have hundreds of things in my yard, and that is literally the t- number one or number two most potent nutrient dense food in the yard, plant wise, yeah. by far. Dandelion, so, dandelion up there, and moringa, man. Nutrient dense. All right, see you guys. Pleasure, Longo. I'll let you close out with you guys. Thanks for the invite, buddy. I appreciate you always. Peace, Spencer. You're Thank gonna, you, man. 
you're going to, the Smithsonian's coming after you. You're going to be big someday. You're already big in my book, buddy. Bye. Oh, thanks, Spence. See ya. Have a good night, man. Okay, guys, here. No. Oh. Boom. The Moringa Man. Go hit that website. Support me. Give me some fucking money, yo. I'm a big, I'm a big. No. But for real, if you want to support, sign up, do that. It helps Alex, it helps me propel the channel forward. It's good. It's actually good. My girlfriend's taking it. I'm taking it. This stuff's really good. Helps you out. Fills you full of energy. Nutrient dense. If you're eating a bunch of garbage, you can at least incorporate that. And all right, I won't, won't pitch it too much more, but I'm going to sign off. You guys have a good night. Peace. Thank you.